Hare Krishna Madhavanandru. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. It's been a long separation. Delighted to have you back. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So good to see you again, Prabhuji. I've been following you sometimes with some of your other talks. You've been really, really busy. It's, you're doing a nice thing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, bro. Actually, you are the seed of this. I remember our meeting in my in Puri was the meeting that gave me this idea of doing this. When we sat and talked, and uh-huh. yes, okay, students were there together, sitting and hearing. Uh-huh. And one of them told me that you know, we never heard senior devotees talking like this. So it was so inspiring. So the two of us had talked, and they were. So I thought, you know, we could do it more also. So that was that experience was one of the inspirations for starting this. So I'm indebted to you. So you could say you are the, one of the founders of the Monk podcast. <laughs> well, great. But but I have I have some bakshish that I that I want. My bakshish is that you should come back, <laughs> and we'll do it in person. Then we'll get to feed you some prasadam oh, because I, I, you're you're too skinny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> My gosh, you know that's all the bakshis you are. Uh, seeking that's the bakshis you are giving to me. I would love to come there and be with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it'll be our benefit, and uh, any devotees who are here in the ashram will have some will have some talk like we did last time and you know, some interactive thing with everybody. That's really really special, really special. Yes, true. So, Pro, today I thought I, I would love to come whenever I can, but let's try to have that association virtually today. So, I thought that today we could discuss about the broad Gaudiya Vaishnava legacy in Bengal and Orissa, especially Orissa, and how you know you are trying to continue it and preserve it. And you, you mentioned that you okay. also started a forum to preserve and continue it. So could you talk something about that today? Yeah, that sounds great. So I, I've, got, I've got some pictures today I'd like to share with you. We'll go ahead and start with this. This is our logo, our preliminary logo we're working on. This says Gora. Now, if you read Bengali and you read Odia, <laughs> if you look at the script underneath the word, it's a combination of both. The, the first uh, syllable is Go, and the second syllable Ra. First syllable is in Bengali, and the second syllable is in Odia. And the word Gora, with a long A at the end, is a common spelling in Gaudiya Vaishnava Padavali Kirtan as a name for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it, it's a compound name. It means that person is Govinda Radha. Oh. And in our case, Gora stands for the Gaudiya Odia Research Association. <laughs> and we have a PPP. Our PPP is Preserve, Publish, Practice. That's our meditation. We have those Beautiful. three things. Well, that's Gora is brilliant. So there's a, you could say it's almost like a traditional acronym and a contemporary acronym now, both brought together. <laughs> so yeah, we, we've been having some interesting response from it. I, I, we're getting good good support with it here in Arissa. A lot of scholars and people appreciate it. But when I ask them, what do you think of you know combining the Bengali and the Odia like this? They don't like Bengalis always. <laughs> it's oh, really? and they, some, sometimes they have some little harsh things to say. Said, no, it should be mostly Odia culture. But I'm not satisfied with that because we want to have a combination of both because I'm coming from a Gaudiya background, mm-hmm. but we want to learn something about Odia Vaishnavism. And it, it is such a wonderful culture, such a wonderful resource, which very, very few people know about. So... Previously, you, if I can just go on speaking, you asked me something about our inspiration. Yes. For, uh, so just one minute before this that. project. Sorry, just one minute. The guy's yeah. name Gora. I thought it was just a variant of Gaura. So is that also one more meaning, or that would be G A U R A, and this is G O R A. Yeah, I mean, if you if you transliterate it in the system that we use in ISKCON. You know, one spelling for Garanga Mahaprabhu's name is G A U R A, and that yes. A sound, A U, is one syllable. Uh, but there's another spelling which I, I could, if I dug around some, I could find in some of our books here. But Bhaktivinoda uses it sometimes, and that we would transliterate as G O R A. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, you can see, I, I actually have a little nom stamp, which uh, this is in Bengali. 
and it's it's like that for those if you can look at it backwards <laughs> it, it, it would be spelled like a g-o-r in a long a and again it, it traditionally means that that personality who's a combined form of govinda radha it's a very sweet alternative kind of way to spell gora instead of g-a-u g-o-r-a okay so there are three meanings in that sense then of that name yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to give credit it, it's my wife's idea we were i was talking for a long time about a research institute something which we'll talk about our ins inspirations for this fuck your mom prabhu is one of them and uh she suggested this acronym gora and i just wow i just completely loved it <laughs> although as i mentioned some people in arissa are not so enthusiastic about it but our work is not only with odia literature and i'd like to speak about that later but there's books like this uh rasik mohan vidyabhushan his uh gambiraya shri goranga and this is Neela Chala Braja Madhuri. These are two books about Garanga Mahaprabhu in Puri that are written in Bengali. And there's a number of books. We're having these two translated and some others that go very deep into the esoteric culture of Arissa from the Bengali side. And then there's the Odia side also. And we're trying to, to make some union of that. And that unity is uh, on different levels. It, we're not just coming in trying to preach to the Odia people that, that this is Bengali Godia culture and you should like it, nor are we trying to just go and uh, spring something on all the Iskan devotees or Godia devotees that we've got this far out Odia thing, but we actually want to make a synthesis in one sense where we they learn from each other and bring out the best in each other. And uh, as I think we'll speak a little more in a later, uh, we have a lot of thoughts about this, how, how it can affect our contemporary Vaishnav society, both within ISKCON and without of ISKCON, because Gora technically is, is part of the BRC, the Bhaktivedanta Research Center, and uh, it, uh, the BRC is not technically an ISKCON project, which is needed. You know, ISKCON does very good, as, as uh, you and I were speaking a few minutes ago, mm. as a, a preaching in new people, training new people, educating them for, for training them to be uh, preachers and, and priests and like that. But it doesn't always do well in the secular society. And we have some vision with Gora to be able to mix with them, because as you mentioned to me a few minutes ago, generally people in, in in india anyway when they think of iskan and people generally appreciate iskan but they generally think of us as a preaching kind of movement a missionary movement and mm. people who are not interested in missionaries they just block us off but i'm finding that when you start talking to them about old rare books all of a sudden doors start opening <laughs> people's oh. hearts melt and you have scholars coming to see you and people from other traditions and then it's an interesting thing because uh, all of a sudden I, I, I have to be more than just ISKCON. <laughs> I have to be myself. I have to be a person. And uh, then, and they, they, otherwise they don't appreciate that. And, and I can be myself and be an ISKCON devotee, be wearing a dhoti and tilak and all that and interested in this Godia culture, but also very supportive and appreciative of the Odia culture and very interested in it. And it, it really melts their hearts and it's opening so many doors. So I, that's one benefit I see from it. And there's, I'm also saying I, I think it'll provide a safe place for intellectuals in our society. For me, one of the symptoms of a progressive society, a culture, is that there's room for intellectuals and artists. And if there's no room for intellectuals and artists, then you failed. And you may have a huge army that does the, what do you call it, the duck step or something like they were doing in, in Nazi Germany, and they all march together very nicely, but that's not culture. We want culture where people are thinking and uh, and that's difficult sometimes in an institution when you're training new people who are not who are not used to go to your culture and you, you have simple things like how to clean yourself and which hand to eat with and things like that. And there's a lot of rules and things like that because it's in an ashram, which is like a monastery. 
But if we can get outside of the box and really just present our culture, that's good for devotees too. The devotees, the intellectuals and artists, we'd like to give them some space where they can come and be themselves and empower them to, to work within that. So we have a whole variety of visions for Gora. That's amazing. Now, two, three things. So what it struck me when you spoke was that I started realizing that when we talk about Krishna consciousness, it's, uh, there are so many, multi, so many dimensions to it. And there are many people who may be Krishna conscious in different ways from what we consider as standard. And we, that may not be what we aim for as an institution, but there is no reason why we need to discourage that. So somebody who's just like you said, somebody who's simply appreciating Gaudiya literature said you know, they certainly have some level of Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, why would they appreciate that? And uh, so if we can nurture that, that is, uh, that is also very valuable. And uh, I was reading a book on uh, how more and more in today's world, religion is becoming decentralized. That there, are, there may be these big mega churches in America, but more and more what happens is religions forms, there are like organizational units and there are organic units. So more and more people are gravitating to organic units based on not so much shared affiliation as shared interests. So in one sense, you could say that the interest in literature that you have, uh, many devotees may not have that literature. In fact, the, as soon as you show some books to devotees, they would say, I don't even have time to read Prabhupada's books. When, I go, when am I going to read that? What is, okay, I may buy a book and keep in my library, but I'm not going to read it. So those who have that interest, certainly if we can create facilities for reaching out to them, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Or as, a, as a sannyasi friend of mine told me once, he was preaching in South America. And uh, he, this was like in the late 70s, early 80s that he was preaching and giving classes there. And one day in one class, Bhagavatam class, he quoted someone named Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. <laughs> and after the class, one of the devotees came to him and said, is he bona fide? This Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, is he bona fide? So that happens. And, and that may sound funny for those of you who know Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, who I hope is all the listeners. But uh, it's not necessarily something we should criticize because young devotees, they, they don't know so much. And, and, and we just necessarily tell them that Prabhupada's books are everything. And, and, and that's a fact. Prabhupada's books are everything. And that's all that we need is Prabhupada's books. But Prabhupada in his books says to read Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. And he says to read uh, Sanatana Goswami and, and different literatures. So not everybody is going to take that up, but we should have some intellectual side in our society. Otherwise, as I said, the culture is not going to be satisfying. Mm. Yeah, so true. Actually, I sometimes we yeah. I sometimes we think that an, that an institution or a society will create culture, but it's just the opposite. Culture creates a society. It's not that the society creates culture, rather the other way, culture creates a society. So for that, we need to go deep. We need to think and, and, and we need to have poetry and thoughtful writings and commentaries and paintings and et cetera. That's a beautiful thought. Yeah, in one sense, if you, if you say society as a group of people, what is going to bind them, bind them together? It's ultimately some cultural aspect. It can be art, it can be intell intellectual interest. There has to be some shared interest. And those shared interests ultimately manifest as the multiplicity of human culture. So yeah, society doesn't uh, create culture. Society might facilitate certain cultural forms, but then those cultural forms, when, when people, people around those interests, they join together, they will actually bond very nicely. So in one sense, you could say, it's just a continuation of the principle of sajatiya, uh, applied in a broader yes. context. Mm, yeah. We've been speaking a lot about eco-villages lately. We have some interest in that. We're trying to start something. And one friend of mine, uh, he, is, he has a vision. He says that in, every, in a community, you'll have smaller villages within the community. 
And the smaller villages, that's what he calls uh, Swajatiya Sangha. We have a group of three or four or five or six devotees. Maybe you have 50 people or 100 people in your community, but you have five or 10 different smaller groups who are like-minded, and he calls those villages. And that's natural, that that should be encouraged. Oh, yeah, that is so true. I think uh, that, 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 that will be even more, you could say, focused group together where people with shared interests can be together. Yeah. You know, going back to your earlier point about, uh, about uh, the Gaudiya legacy, in some ways, uh, we in ISKCON, it seems almost like we have a very narrow understanding of the Gaudiya tradition. So could you may take, may take a step back and we can discuss about how the Gaudiya tradition is existing in currently in Orissa? In, are do people, are there practitioners? Are there the, in general cultural awareness is there? Are there people who are uh, scholars who are researching? And maybe then we can go back toward the history, how it continued after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If that's the direction you are comfortable okay. taking. Sure, sure. We, we can just meander around a little bit. First of all, I, I can only speak in a natural way from my perspective. And I uh, I only understand very little Odia language. I can read a few letters a little bit. And here I am <laughs> working as a research center. How is that? What inspiration do I have? I'm coming from an ISKCON perspective, but I have a, a, a perspective about Gaudiya culture, which Odia, Odia Gaudiya culture, which I find a lot of local people find interesting and fascinating because it's from a different perspective, from a different view. And that oh. began with my Guru Marsh. This is my Guru Marsh here, Prabhupada's disciple, Gorgavinda Maharaj. It's an old picture. You can, this picture says a lot, I think. Amazing. He I came from. Yeah, he, he came from Jagat Singhpur. He came from a very traditional Odia culture, Kirtan culture, in a small village known as Gadaigiri. And uh, I had good fortune to hear some from him. And that was kind of an unusual thing, especially for Westerners. But there's some Indian devotees who get some opportunity like that. But uh, for Western devotees, it's, it's a very unusual thing for them to get some opportunity to associate with, with, with traditional persons in other cultures. So my grandma's greatly inspired me. Uh, probably, I, I would have to say, I, I can show you a beautiful picture that I like. This is a picture someone took of the two of us together. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, probably the greatest gift my grandmas gave me, you can kind of maybe see in this picture here, this photo, is to think. And to think in a certain way, and to look in a certain direction, and to ask questions. Probably that's the, the greatest uh, gift that he gave me. And he did that through that audio culture. And I wish I could say that, that every class that he spoke, that I remembered every single <laughs> verse that he quoted and every song that he sang and every single story. But it's not like that. It's not like that for anyone. I have imbibed a certain amount of things and uh, a big inspiration came from him. And so now you, you have some people, myself included and a few others, who are becoming, by his influence, becoming interested in this Odia culture through Srila Prabhupada's window. Our, our Guru Maharaj was a disciple, Srila Prabhupada. I can show you a couple of rare photos that I got from the Bhaktivedanta archives. This is in Mayapur in 1974. And you see Srila Prabhupada walking. I don't remember the name of this Grihasa devotee. And this is Bhavananda Prabhu on the right, the sannyasi at that time. And there on the left, this very skinny devotee in brahmachari dress that's our burmash gorgavinda marsh oh, and uh, okay. so he was a little different in iskan because he already came from a vaishnav culture he already had some some culture that he brought with him and when he would speak he would give classes for sometimes three or four hours at a time and he would sing and he was fluent in bengali and odia and sanskrit and also english and he would quote from so many different things. And he had a particular style, which was very different. 
And Prabhupada encouraged him in that. So he was a great inspiration for that. He wanted us for Prabhupada's centennial to start a university for oh. Srila Prabhupada. And it's a long, complicated thing. Like many different projects, it ended up not working out. But Gora, as uh, we could discuss perhaps further, we have some idea to try to do something like that in terms of a university and things too. Oh, okay. So in one sense, you are saying that your connection with the whole uh, Gaudiya and Odia culture has come primarily through the inspiration and association of your Guru Maharaj. Yes, and also one other personality. Since is it, you like the pictures I'm showing, is this okay? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. I'll, I'll show you another picture. This is uh, my Guru Maharaj on the left. And this uh, gentleman on the right, who's wearing white, this is Professor Fakir Mohan Das. Interesting Vaishnav name, <laughs> Fakir Mohan. And it's a long story. I wrote something for Satya Raja Scholarly Journal about him. Fakir Mohan Prabhu, I met him a little before my Guru left this world. And he's been a very great inspiration for us. I attended classes from him for over 10 years. And uh, he was uh, flattering us, uh, praising us, chastising us, and whatever way he could to uh, encourage us to serve our guru and, and to serve Srila Prabhupada. But at the same time, he was also very, very conversant in Odia culture. And this is another picture of him here, a very effulgent personality. He's a research scholar. He's a PhD uh, from Utkal University in uh, I, let me see here. I think I could tell you his complete uh, his complete academic and devotional title was Vaishnava Pravara Fakir Mohandas M A PhD Doc D Lit Sahitya Charya Vyakarna Shastri. <laughs> That's his complete <laughs> academic and devotional title. <laughs> yeah, he's quite a, a scholar. He. he uh, knew my grandmas at a young age, and at, at the age of nine, he ran away from home because he wanted to be a sadhu. The family life is Maya, and he, he grew up chanting Hare Krishna and reading this books of Bhaktivinoda talk where his favorite book was Hari Nam Shantamani and worshiping Jagannath. And he decided family life is Maya, my parents are Maya, and I want to be a sadhu. And so he ran away from home at nine years old, and his parents captured him a few villages away and brought him back. And then he managed, they managed to keep him for some time. And then at the age of 12, again, he ran away from home. And that time he came to Puri to, at, the, at that time, the only existing Gaudiya Mutt, which was the Purushota Mutt, which is right near Tota Gopinath. That's the only temple directly established by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. And as a young boy, he moved in there. And it's a very long story. But uh, at one point, the authorities there in the temple they saw that he was a bright young man, and they said, you should go back to school. And he said, I don't want to go to school. I came here to do Vaishnav Seva and to do Bhajan. No, no, you should go to school. And then they found out that he was a very bright student. So his guru finally instructed him that you should get a PhD in Sanskrit, and you should teach Gaudiya, Odia culture in the university as a kind of way of preaching. And so he did like that. And his whole life was a kind of a cross between academia and devotional life. The, the, his students called him the, the, the Babaji. <laughs> and he, uh, okay. he, he had, I don't know, probably uh, maybe a hundred or more people get their PhDs under him. He was probably the foremost authority on Gaudiya, Odia literature in Orissa. And he wrote a number of books and published many, many books. So he's, he wanted to start a research institute. In fact, my girl, his idea for the university was going to be with Fakir Mohan Prabhu. He brought Fakir Mohan Prabhu to meet Srila Prabhupada when Prabhupada came to Bhubanishwar in 1977. And Fakir Mohan Prabhu was a very, very simple, humble person, was very inspired by Prabhupada. And so then later, after my Gurmaj left, Fakir Mohan Prabhu came and, and was helping us and, and preaching to us and giving us classes and nourishing us. And he wanted to open a research institute. 
and somehow he wanted me to help him with that, even though I'm not an academic. But I like books, as you remarked. And uh, we had a lot of discussions about that. And then he left this world a few years ago. And I've been meditating on this ever since, that we should do this research institute. So these are two big inspirations for us, mm -hmm. these two personalities in our life. That's fascinating. I, mean, I have read about Fakir Mahmoud, but I didn't know uh, specific details that he had run, uh, got run away at the age of nine. I knew he was a great scholar, but it's an inspiring story. So the idea of, say, devotees going back to academia, it's not just in ISKCON. There are precedents in the Gaudiya tradition before that also. That's, yes. So, so and, you, and although Srila okay. Prabhupada said so much about how, you know, schools are, are what we call them slaughterhouses and like that. And that's a fact. Prabhupada wasn't mincing words. He wasn't flattering that they, they are a slaughterhouse. But at the same time, they also have some benefit. And Prabhupada told uh, uh, different devotees that to stay in the university and to use their, their PhD, like Bhakti Shubh Dhamana Maharaj and, and others, to, to preach. And at, in fact, at one point, I think Garuda mentions this. Maybe he spoke about this in one of your podcasts also. But he mentioned how Srila Prabhupada at one time wanted every temple to be connected with an, a, an institution, a, a, a university. And every temple should be able to offer master's degree and, and, and PhDs. He wanted every temple to do that. And that desire of Srila Prabhupada, as far as I know, there's not one single temple in the whole world that's done that. But Prabhupada wanted every major temple to do that. So it, it's, some, it's, it's a desire of Srila Prabhupada, which is lacking in our society. That's remarkable. I had no idea. I knew Prabhupada wanted a Bhaktivedanta Institute. And there is a, a letter where Prabhupada said, if any person who comes to our movement is well-educated, they should be first sent to the Bhaktivedanta Institute. And if they can be engaged there, then that's good. Otherwise, they can come back and do other temple services. So, so Prabhupada did appreciate that the role the local intellectuals could play in the movement. That's definitely there. But every temple leading, having that, that's quite remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 I, 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 uh, what is it? Nam Rasta Prabhu, if I can mention your competitors. <laughs> Nam Rasta Prabhu with his oh, yeah, very good uh, friends. So, yeah. program or whatever he calls it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give a little plug for Nam Rasta. He's my friend also. Nam Rasta <laughs> Prabhu, when he interviewed Garuda, Garuda mentioned that. And, and I, that's a good source because Garuda was an academic disciple Srila Prabhupada during Prabhupada's time. So I, I, I would consider that, that comment to be authoritative. Yes, definitely. We have some vision with Gora that primarily we want it to be a research institute and we want to find old rare books. Like uh, we've been compiling a number of things. This is a book by Kanai Kuntia called Mahabhav Prakash, which uh, was written he says, in, it, Kanai Kunti was one of the associates of Mahaprabhu. He's mentioned twice in Chaitanya Charitamrita. He was the head priest in the Jagannath Mandir and a great devotee of Mahaprabhu. But he says in the beginning of this book that he learned these things from Roy Ramananda in the Gambira. So this is a very authentic, very old book. And there's a number of other such books, too, that we're trying to work on. This is another one here. This is uh, Roy Ramananda Padavali in Odia. Uh, which is a collection of rare, practically never seen before songs of Ramananda Roy, which the State Museum in Arista in Bhubaneswar, they, they compiled into a book. So we're working on translating that and a number of different books. Chaitanya Chakada, this is a biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from 500 years ago, and Vaishnavi Lamrita. This is a book called Manasiksha, which is written by uh, Bhakti Charandas who is in the line of uh, Gadadhar Pandit, and uh, Bhakti Charandas, he uh, wrote a commentary on Raghunath Das Goswami's Manasiksha. And it, it's just amazing <laughs> what he wow. wrote. So these books are very, very little known. You, you devotees are a little academic, or a little bit learned. They would be familiar with two oh, <laughs> heavy books, uh, which I'll show these are in Bengali. This is the Godi of Vaishnav Abhidan. This was compiled by a great scholarly devotee named Hari Das Das. Actually, Fakir Mohan Prabhu was his personal servant. And he 
I think Vaishnav Vidhan sh- making that was the great desire of Bhaktisana Sri Thakur, isn't it? And then yes. com- completed after and, and, his departure. Yes. And on Bhaktisiddhanta's request, Haridas Das took up the work further. So okay. that, that's a great work. But in that book, there's very, very, there's practically nothing about Odia Gaudiya literature. Because Haridas Das couldn't read Odia. And that wasn't his, his, his forte. So he instructed okay. Fakir Mohan Prabhu that you should in- increase the Abhidhan and add to it about Odia literature. And that's something that he unfortunately never got to do. But he was certainly meditating on it and spoke to us a lot about it. And in some ways, he contributed with his whole life, like Mahabhav Prakash, that book we were just showing you, or this Manasiksha of Bhakti Charandas. These are books that he very carefully searched out for many, many years. And as a professor, he used to, to joke with us that he never had a home in his whole life. And he was really a oh. fucker, really a beggar. And oh. all the money that he got as a professor later, he, when he retired, he used to print these books. He was just, this is a, a labor of love for his whole life. And he printed many, many rare books like Purusha Bodhani Shruti, the Papalaita Saka of the Tarva Veda, uh, which is quoted by Rupa Goswami in some of his literatures, but that book had been practically lost. The Garanga Bhagavat, which is by uh, Odia poet named Bhagavan Das, uh, many, many different Banamali Padyavali. There is a collection he printed of a Gaudiya poet named Banamali Das. There's a book, Braj Bihar, that he did by an Odia Vaishnav named Dasarati Das, who was born in the 1700s. Many, 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 so many different books. Chaitanya Bilas is an Odia Vaishnav named Madhava Rat, who wrote this book about the pastimes of Mahaprabhu. He wrote so many, many books about Mahaprabhu. In fact, my grandma once commented that Fakir Mahaprabhu knew more about uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Orissa than anyone on the planet. And partly that was because when he did his uh, doctoral thesis in 1983, he, uh, he, he wrote his thesis was called Prachin Odia Sahitjari Sri Chaitanya Charit, a study of uh, books about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in, in ancient Odia literature. And so many different chapters. Chapter one speaks about the different biographies of Mahaprabhu in uh, both Bengali and in Odia. And chapter two, he uh, wrote which, a, a, a chapter which he later printed in a small book, this book here, called Sri Chaitanya Padanka Puta Odisha, which means the footprints of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Odisha. And it's a compilation of research he did over many decades uh, describing Mahaprabhu's journey from West Bengal to Orissa and all the places he visited on the way. And he personally went to all the villages and found many times there are deities there that are 500 years old of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or, or of Goran Nityananda Prabhu. And sometimes they had local stories, remembrances of Mahaprabhu's visit. And so he compiled all that into a wonderful book which we also want to translate and expand on, actually, because uh, those places are still there and there's still research that can be done on those places. So that's another thing we want to try to do with Gora. Oh, okay. So <laughs> one dimension is the books and the other is even the holy places. That's, it's almost something like uh, when the Goswamis went to Rindavan, or Ch- sent by Lord Chaitanya to Rindavan, they, they had, of course, I don't think they were recovering literature, but they were recovering temples and building temples, <laughs> writing literature, and I think embodying Vaishnu qualities. So that is, it's amazing. So now, these books that you are mentioning, are they books that are, uh, that are, since you said they were published by Fakir Mohan, so are they books that are uh, read by scholars or are they read even by practitioners or is uh, how much is the current cultural influence of Gaudiya Vaishnavism in today's Orissa? It's gone down a lot. I, um, the, it, it's different in different ways. I would say if you want to compare West Bengal culture, Gaudiya culture, to the Gaudiya culture in Orissa, in some ways the culture in Orissa is stronger. There's more oh, Hare Krishna Kirtan. There's more worship of Gornitai. Gornitai is worshipped in practically every village in Orissa. But one thing West Bengal has that I see that Orissa doesn't have, 
and that is they, they love their literature. Bengalis are very, very proud of their Bengali literature. Whereas <laughs> I, I, I've been working a little bit with the IYF in, in uh, Bhubaneswar and giving classes once a week to the students there. And I've naturally been asking them, you know, since you're Odia students, we're looking for these books, can you help us? And I came to find out something very interesting that a lot of them, they don't really know Odia very well. They know English better than they know Odia. Because oh, the culture today, it, it, it's uh, Odia is kind of looked down on like it's backward, but English is very high class. Hindi is high class, and English is very, very high class. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's their vision. So one of the things, one of the dreams that I have, we're hoping to try to do someday with Gora, is we'd like to have a bookstore. I'm, I'm a book lover. If, if you talk to any book lover of Bengali books, they'll know about the Sanskrit Pushtak Bandar in Kolkata. Hmm. It's an old bookstore, which uh, they, they have Sanskrit books and Bengali books. They publish rare old books, but they also purchase books. If your grandfather died and he had a library and you don't care about books, you just want to get rid of them, you can take those books to them and they'll pick through them and decide, we'll buy this and this and they probably pay for, you know, 50 rupees a kg or something <laughs> for the <laughs> books. The <KG>. okay. <laughs> okay. And they buy those books, and some of them they may keep, some of them they may sell. We'd like to do that. We'd like to, Fakim Rambu told me we want to have a bookstore with all the books, and, but primarily, of course, with Prabhupada's books. But we want to have books in Odia language and Hindi and Bengali because Puri is such a place where there's many different yatris coming, pilgrims coming. And we'd like to have so many books for them, but we'd also like to have something where scholars will come and look for books. And for that reason, mm. we have to have all kinds of books, even books we may not agree with, but that, that's just what you have to have. But we want to keep prominent Srila Prabhupada's books and the books of our Sampradaya. And as part of that, our vision is we want to reprint Fakir Mahabrabhu's books. You can kind of tell maybe from the camera, I think, the quality of printing of this book it's not very high quality. Hmm. It's about the cheapest paper you can get. And uh, the printing's very, very cheap because he was a poor sadhu. But we'd like to print this in a better way. Just like this, uh, I'll show you another book. This is Chaitanya Chakada in Odia. It's a biography of Mahaprabhu. And this is a contemporary printing. And you can see the ink is very nice, nice printing in that. So we'd like to try to print some of these audio books of Fakir Mohan Prabhu in their language and encourage the local people to read Prabhupada's books, of course, in, in Odia, but also show them your own culture and do that through literature, distribution, selling, and printing, research, and do that through having classes. And as I was mentioning, uh, you can slow me down if I'm going too fast. No, no, I, I have a I have a lot of my mind about this. Gore is not only about uh, preserving, researching, and printing and translating books, but we want to focus on research. I just like for myself, uh, I don't have, maybe I have just one second. I've done some research over the years of some of our magazines, Krishna Katamrita. In this magazine, The Hidden Identity of Lord Jagannath, we wrote about a topic which Krishna Chaitanya who you recently interviewed, wonderful mm. Vaishnav scholar who's very encouraging to us, uh, told me, he said, my God, Madhavananda, you're asking questions no one's ever asked before, but you're also giving pramanas for it. And, and the question we asked in particular was, if Jagannath is Vrindavan Bihari Krishna, where is Radha? <laughs> he said, nobody's even asked that question. And we find it in the literature. We find it in Jagannath. We find it in the puja of Jagannath and the identity of Jagannath. Many, many pramanas. It's a long topic. But that's a kind of research subject that we would like to encourage in Gora to find out more about Jagannath Puri, more about Jagannath, more about Bengali, Gaudi, Odia culture. So our, our desire and it's one of our uh, benefits for working with devotees like Krishna Chaitra Maharaj and with other scholars too, uh, that 
uh, we want to open up a, a, not just a research institute, but a place where we have classes and people can come and they can study traditional Odia literature. They can study uh, music, traditional Sangeet. And I would like to see some traditional Bengali Murdunga players and as well as Odia ones because they have little different techniques. And we have, I have in mind to have three types of teachers. It's a very unique concept, conception, I think, of an educational institution because it would be accredited. We, we would have some, uh, uh, some rec re uh, recognition from uh, Oxford University, and I think they're getting it from the University of, of Kolkata right now, as well as Mumbai University. They're, they're connected with them. So we would be able to offer through their a master's degree or a PhD, but the teachers we'd like to have would be secular professors, but also mm -hmm. local gurus who can teach us about Odissi dance and music, and not just the, the, uh, the style, but about the, the, the philosophy behind it. Because I find, for example, we talk about o o Odissi dance, there are many devotees even who know about Odissi dance, and they know how to do move their feet like this, and they know how to do this mudra and that mudra, but there's very few who know the philosophy behind it. Oh, and we okay. would like to promote that. And we would also like to promote uh, traditional agricultural culture. You were speaking a little bit earlier with, with uh, this young lady who works with this, Anapayani Radha, and I'm hoping that she can be a professor. She already has a degree in uh, landscape architecture, and she's studied some permaculture. I'm encouraging her that she should study and teach spiritual ecology. And we should show people how to live a natural life and live cold, look closer to the land and grow organic food and how to grow nice trees and how to build nice houses in a traditional way, but not just in a traditional, not just in a traditional, but in a traditional cultural way. Because there's also philosophy and culture and art that go with those buildings and even also with the harvest festivals and with the planning of, of the, the crops and what day you plant them on and and there's prayers and things you, you may offer to, to krishna and garanga mahaprabhu at certain times for your crops and, and like that and that culture we want to continue we want to we're hoping that the students in that school will be uh iskan devotees perhaps but also devotees from other different uh, muts and groups uh, people, uh, local Odia people, and perhaps Westerners also. That, that's some vision we have. And again, as I was mentioning in the beginning, a, a big desire I have for Gora is to, to enable us to connect with different scholars, with different personalities. And I, 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 I can see on three different levels, at least, that we can connect. We can connect with, with secular scholars who are devotees in one sense, like you said, that they, they may love Bengali Gaudiya Vaishnavism, but they may not be a strict practitioner, but they know about the, the tradition and they love the literature and things. So those kind of persons, as well as ISKCON pundits, as well as, as local, like we have our Hari Parshi Prabhu or, or, or other devotees who are very learned in Sanskrit and Gaudiya literature who are devotees, they can also teach. And then we should also have local gurus Kirtan gurus and whatever, and I'd like to see that both from Arisha and from West Bengal coming here. That's a long-term vision that we have. And actually, we're looking at some property now with a school, a three-story building, to try to That's we have amazing. some hope and desire about that. So, Prabhu, what? what? <laughs> you, you, you are a lot of. I can see your your heart's devotion, and if I may use the word devotional passion. Coming out in what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, it does seem that what we talked earlier about the society and culture, uh, you really would like to reach beyond the institutional boundaries. And in one sense, uh, for this kind of cultural work, the institutional boundaries, they don't really, uh, they don't have to, we could say, bind us or restrict us if you can share Krishna Bhakti to very these people and we can preserve what is there. So going back to a couple of points earlier, you made some point which is, I feel, maybe it's like a, you know, in some TV serials, they have a cliffhanger, which you have to watch the next episode, <laughs> <laughs> next episode to know. So can you share what is the answer about 
Radha being there in Jagannath Puri? Or do we need a next episode for that? <laughs> My grandma had an expression which I found it, it has a philosophical, has a philosophical, historical, uh, scriptural, deity worshiping base. To it. And that expression was Radha Viraha Vidura Rup. And that means that, that that's Jagannath. Jagannath is uh, Krishna on the outside, but Radha on the inside. He's the embodiment of separation from Radha. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna Viraha Vidura Rup. He, if separation from Krishna can manifest a form, that form is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's the last limit of that form. So we found with Lord Jagannath, some very interesting things. That with Lord Jagannath, well, first of all, in the Jagannath Ashtakam, which right now it's a project I'm working on with some of the BRC members. We're working on a, uh, a critical edition of Jagannath Ashtakam. And okay. trying to, we, we found one 15th century manuscript. We're trying to compile different manuscripts, and they have different readings. Some of, the, some of the words are a little different. We're going to compile and give a, a comparison of the different readings. And we also want to write some commentary on it. And that's a, a really big subject. If you get me started on that, <laughs> the whole nother, whole nother. and we want to speak about the authorship of it. But one of my premises is that within that Jagannath Ashtakam, we find the identity of Lord Jagannath. And in the uh, sixth verse, it said, Rasanandi Radha Sadasa Vapur Alingana Sukha that uh, alingan, alingana suk with great ecstasy lord jagannath is always embracing radharani to his chest what does that mean <laughs> i was a pujari for lord jagannath in bhubaneshwar for many years i used to undress him at night and put him to rest i would bathe and dress him in the morning and i never saw radharani stuck on his chest <laughs> i've never uh, met any pujari who uh had that kind of revelation but at the same time we we have this verse and what does the verse mean so this is one pramana and then we did a little more research and we found out that during the Navakalevram festival you're familiar with Navakalevram yes, yes, yes. okay yes, so for some listeners who may not be that Navakalevram festival takes place every like I don't know 15 or 20 or so years according to lunar calculations it's a complicated thing with that and it's the time when they change lord jagannath's body and they go and they find a new daro and it's very complicated how they do that so we found out about the process they do finding that tree and again it's they, they go to kakapur a particular temple they fast until mangalama who's jagannath's auntie appears before them in a dream and tells them where the daro is and then based oh. on that dream they'll go they'll go to that place and then the tree has to have four branches not two not three not five not ten only four branches there has to be a shanka chakra gutta padma symbols of the, the four symbols of vishnu on the tree or they won't accept it there has to be a lake nearby a small mountain nearby a crematorium nearby a shiva temple nearby an anthill there has to be a cobra living at the base of the tree and if all those things are not there they won't do it so there's so many rituals and I'm getting to the point <laughs> one of the rituals they do when they cut the tree down one of the pundits comes with a solid gold axe an axe made out of solid gold it's a little smaller than my small finger <laughs> and oh, it's not very practical they just touch it to the tree and then they have a silver axe which they touch to the tree and then some fellow comes with an iron axe and he does the hard work so he cuts the tree down then they cut off the branches they peel off the, the bark and then they do Purusha Shukta Abhishek for the tree, okay? Because they, they want to take away any uh, fault that may be there in the tree. And then, as part of the deity worship, part of the Pranapatista, the installation ceremony, they have what's called Soda Nyasa. Nyasa means when you place the identity of the deity on that form. You have, you have a form of Krishna it, it made out of brass, let's say, you bought in Lloyd Bazaar. But mm -hmm. Krishna has not been called there. And although it's the form of Krishna, that form doesn't know who he is. 
And so to tell him who he is, just like you tell a child, your name is Krishna Das, your name is Radha Dasi, you, you give a name to your, your daughter or son, and you give them an identity. Nyasa means we give an identity to that form. And so there's a certain mantra that goes with that form. Now we managed to find out a so very Nyasa secret. is different from Pranapatishta, or are they different traditions themselves? Sorry to interrupt you. Nyasa is part of Pranapatishta. Okay. It's, a, it's one of the most important aspects of it. Okay. I, I used to do Pranapatisa, some for my Gurmars. That was another, one of my first services. I was a Pujari like that. I, I installed the deities of Radha Gopinath and some Gornitai deities and different things. Anyway, uh, but we managed to find that Soda Nyasa mantra that gives the identity to Lord Jagannath. Oh. When they find that dark tree, they cut the branches off. They cut the bark off, they do that abhishek to purify everything, a chant Purusha Shukta, and then the head priest comes with this a secret mantra. And he chants this Soda Nyasa mantra. And we found out that mantra, I could read it to you in Sanskrit, <laughs> it's right here in our article. Uh, I, but it, it's a mantra meditating on Srimati Radharani. Really? Can you read that if you have it? I, I'll just read you the translation because it's, it's a very long Sanskrit shloka and, and, okay. and the, the, the very small in the magazine and my eyesight's not so good. I meditate on Radhika, who is the most beautiful girl in the three worlds. She has a smile on her face and her complexion is the color of kumkum. Her veil is made with the border of her splendid lower cloth. Her dress is delightful and a lotus hangs at the end of her braid. She appears wonderful in her fresh youth, and her eyes extend to her ears. With her thumb and index finger, she is placing a betel leaf in the lotus mouth of Krishna. So that mantra, that's the inner identity of Lord Jagannath. <laughs> that's the tradition. We're not putting words in their mouth. That's the tradition here in Jagannath Puri for who knows how long they, they, they've been doing that. Aside from that, we found out so another... So I just went. So this yeah. is the inner identity of Jagannath means Jagannath himself is considered to be Radha or Radha is present with him or what does this Nyasa well, just, mean? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. Yes, correct. He's a combined yes. form of Radha and Krishna. Yes. He's Krishna. And actually, that's a controversial topic, which I won't get into here. But if you talk to some Vaishnavas in the Dvaita Paribar, for example, I have some friends in that line. They say that, that it's not that Radha and Krishna became one, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna, but Radharani's complexion and mood are covering him. Radha Bhava Duti Savalitam Nomi Krishna. So okay. any of that, that's a technical detail, which to me is kind of a, a mute point. It, it, it's just, uh, just language because we don't see a difference between Radharani's mood and Radharani. We don't see a difference between her complexion and her. So okay. whether they merge okay. together, which they don't like the idea, or, or whether it's just Krishna, but he's adopted Radharani's complexion and mood. So on the, on the inside, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Krishna. Radha Bhava Duti Suvalitam Nomi Krishna Sarupam. Basically, the meaning of that, that verse is that on the outside he's Radha, he's golden, but on the inside he's Krishna. And Jagannath is just the opposite. On the outside, and this is why he's the Isha Dev of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Now, on the outside, he's Krishna, but on the inside, Rasanandi Radha Sadasa Vapura Linganasuko, he's Radha. This Jagannath Ashtakam describes that, and also this Sodanyasa Mantra describes that. And I found a third evidence, which is very interesting. There's a, 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 in the Jagannath Mandir, there's actually a number of deities on the main altar. There, there's uh, Jagannath Baladi Subhadra and Sudarshan. There's also Sri and Bhu, the two consorts of Lord Jagannath. And there's also a deity, a wooden deity of Nila Madhav. And there's also another small deity who is called Arda Nari Ishvara. And that deity, another name for that deity, is the Shayana Vigraha. Now, you haven't heard very much about that deity. It's kind of a secret deity. That's one reason. The other reason is the deity is only about as big as my thumb. <laughs> uh, really? Perhaps another reason is the deity that is solid gold. And that deity has a very simple function. That deity just sleeps. <laughs> because Jagannath's pretty big. He's about 
seven or eight feet high, it's hard to put him in bed. So this Ardhanaya Ishvara, this uh, Shaina Vigraha, the deity who sleeps, that's Jagannath. And they put him to rest. Every day. But why is he called Ardhanari Ishvara? Because he's half Radha and half Krishna. Or half Lakshmi and half Narayan. That deity. Oh. So, I thought it so these to, is, okay, I thought it referred to Shiva, Shiva and Parvati. It is the first actually to Radha and Krishna. Yeah, it, in this case, it, it's, it's Radha and Krishna. Sometimes Shiva and Parvati are also called that too. It's a fact. Yeah. So this is, this is some research that we did. We also yeah. did some research. Have you published this, Prabhu? Our, I don't think I've read this in Krishna yeah. Kamar Bindu till now. Is, was it? That, yeah, that? It, it's our area article Jagannath. and this are this issue we did some interesting research about the history of uh the the policy of bideshi probationary shade the foreigners forbidden going into the Jagannath temple and when did that begin and the first formal i i i i went to the university of, of ukal university and spoke with the leading historian there and i asked him when did it start and he he told me actually i don't know but I did some research with, with the, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, London Library. That's not the what it's called. What's it, the the Library of London? And uh, I managed Council to there? find some the British Library. Thank British, you yeah, with Council the British Library. Library. Yeah. And I managed to find some documents from the the eighteen uh, hundreds that uh describe how that legal that that position began and interestingly ironically paradoxically it began with the british <laughs> the british oh, really? were the ones who made the law forbidding themselves to go inside the temple and there's an interesting story interesting history behind that which is another cliffhanger you're going to demand from me <laughs> i'm afraid yes, that's, definitely. Another that's, a, that's important i mean so, it's, so you're saying that, uh, yeah, in one sense, some things which are present right now, we think that they're probably been present for a long time. And there's some, some, kind of, some kind of restraint, even when Haridas Thakur was not allowed in the temple. So are you saying yes, that even, yes. so there is a date before that from which it started? Well, at the time of Haridas Thakur and Rupa and Sanat and Goswamis, none of them were allowed inside the temple. Balaram Das... Uh, who was a great devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who wrote this book called Bhava Samudra. It's a 500-year-old book. He was not allowed inside the temple because he came from a Sudra caste. Dasha Bauri was not allowed inside the temple because he came from a Sudra caste. Uh, Salabeg was not allowed inside the temple, although he's one of the greatest poets in Odia literature, mm. devotional literature, because his father's name was Lalbeg. His father was a Muslim. Uh, but at that time, there was no formal law. There was oh, no okay. formal rule. But it was the British who made a formal rule. And, and I, I don't want to leave a cliffhanger. You're going to kill me. <laughs> the reason they did that is because the British were very intelligent. And they understood that if we want to control Orissa, we have to get Jagannath on our side. We have to have the common people think that Jagannath is on our side. And the way to get Jagannath on our side is to have the pandas on our side. So they spoke with the pandas. What do you want? And the pandas wanted this thing. There should be some rule. And so I, I think originally they, they forbid, I think it was 16 different castes, like shoemakers, alcohol makers, <laughs> prostitutes, uh, different persons, fishermen, that they were officially forbidden to come in the temple and foreigners also. So that's the first uh, beginning of that, ironically coming from the British themselves. <laughs> so that's a bit of research that we did. I, I, know, I know I don't want to just beat the drum for articles that I've written, but my point in bringing up these topics is I have a passion, as you noted, that I would like to see research going on. I'd like to empower young, intelligent people who may be ISKCON devotees, they may not be ISKCON devotees. They may not be formally devotees at all, but I'd like to empower them to go deep into the culture and tradition of Orissa and West Bengal and find these gems and do it before these things get lost. And my vision is that if we do this, this will be a great preaching tool because when people see me, they, they come, for example, today we went to have Darshan at Tota Gopinath. 
And we walked, there's a local temple of Gopinath about a 10 minute walk from our house, a 350 year old temple. It told the Gopinath about 20 minute rickshaw right away. So we were walking to this first temple and a rickshaw wallet stopped and picked us up and took us to Tota Gopinath. And the same person brought us back. And when he brought us back, I saw he seems to know the, direct, the way to go. Our, our ashram is, very, is kind of a, in a, a rural area almost. It's just on this, the outskirts of the city. And it's very difficult to find. So I just purposely didn't say anything. And he took us right to our house. And turns out he lives uh, about one, one kilometer away from us. And he knows all about us. <laughs> because oh. everybody knows those white guys, <laughs> the Bidashis. Okay. Now, they, some scholars may think of me as Gora, but they're always going to look at me and they're going to think Iskon, no matter what. <laughs> Even oh. if you're a Western scholar who's not an Iskon devotee, and you come here to work with Gora, and I'd like to have some people like do like that, they're going to look at them and think they're Iskon, because white skin, Tidak, especially working with Garanga Mahaprabhu topics and things like that means an ISKCON devotee. That's what they think. So I can't get away from that. But that's something which I want to use. I want them to see, because they, they see me, they think ISKCON. I want them to see me and, and think, oh, this is someone who loves our culture and is doing something for our culture that we're not doing. They're preserving these old rare books. And, and they're trying to, to preserve the, the tradition and philosophy behind the literature, the culture and things. And, and they appreciate that so much. And I benefit as an individual because I learn from them. I learn amazing things. I, I, let, let me tease you a little bit. I, I spoke about this Mana Siksha. Wait, just one minute before you from, go there. Uh, sorry, if you, sorry, if you may. You know, in one sense, when you're saying that when Prabhupada came to India, in one sense, that's what happened, isn't it? People felt that oh, Prabhu the Swami is teaching, Indi is preserving our culture in a way that we are not able to do, is spreading our culture. And there, there were very, in, in one sense, between 1960s, before Prabhupada went to America and 1970s, when he came back from America, there was not a dramatic transformation in people's spiritual commitment to Prabhupada and his teachings. But there was a significant cultural pride that came in. So people didn't become Prabhupada's disciples in that sense, they were not that committed. But because of that cultural pride, or I know the word pride has a slight negative connotation. We could say the we could say the, the cultural appreciation or the cultural joy, we could say in seeing the culture being preserved and spread. So that's what actually attracted them, and they became well wishers. So you know, I was talking with uh, my Guru Maharaj Radhanath Maharaj, he said that when we're doing outreach. There are two kinds of people we will reach to. He says, one is those for whom we open the doors to Krishna. We open the doors and they come to Krishna. And there are others who will open the doors for us to take Krishna to others. They may themselves never come to Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave the example of Allen Ginsberg to some extent for that. He never became, never became a committed devotee, but he was the first influential person who spread uh, Krishna, who, who you know, helped Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness among the young and hip crowd at that time. So, in one sense, the scholars and those kind of people, you are saying, they may themselves never become devotees. The life members in India became, didn't become devotees, but they helped Prabhupada build the temples through which so many people are coming to Krishna. So it's yes. a, I thought I thought it was a strikingly different way of different perspective, but it's a very, very, it's a very accepting perspective from our side toward them, and it's empowering for us because we will reach out to people whom we can't ourselves. Uh, say what one influential scholar, if one influential scholar endorses or appreciates what we are doing, their their the circle under their influence, we can't directly influence them. But if they do that, it yes. opens so many doors for us. Yeah, so in one no, sense, no. okay, just to complete this point, that somehow as we have become established in India, it's our perception has changed from we are preserving Indian culture to we are making brahmacharis. So the idea that ISKCON <laughs> is <laughs> the idea that ISKCON is preserving Indian culture that is no longer a central part of ISKCON's public perception today. So that's in, in one sense unfortunate, 
but uh, so what you are doing in bengal and orissa to some extent uh, that in once you are replicating what prabhupada was doing earlier and fostering that cultural consciousness cultural awareness cultural pride in a healthy sense both so that they will do the work to preserve and they will appreciate and help those who are preserving like you some some years ago it's a little complicated history but some years ago a secular scholar who was working for the uh Odisha State Museum in Bhubaneswar which is has the largest manuscript collection in the world palm leaf manuscript palm leaf manuscript collection and so many gita govindas and they have so many books so somehow for some reason they contacted Dr. Rupa Prabhu and I who worked together on our publication work and he invited us to home initially even they wanted to donate some property to us and that was a little there were some catches and we didn't do that but the reason why he wanted to speak with us he gave me a, a stack of paper which had a list of books and it said things like uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Rita Sindhu by Rupa Goswami and there's all these different lists of books Gaudiya books and next to the author and I marked one of them said uh, Chamatkar Chandrika by Rupa Goswami. And I spoke up, I said, this is a mistake. This book is not written, this is written by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Chamakkar Chandrika, it's not written by Rupa Goswami. And then he said, he said, this is why I called you here today. He said, because in the museum, we have scholars, secular scholars who are doing this work, but they're not practitioners. And you have something that we don't have. Maybe you can't read the manuscripts, Maybe you don't know, you can't read the language, but you know the culture behind you, you know the literature background. And they were inviting us to work with them. That particular uh, opening didn't happen. But it, just like you're saying, doors open like that in a very amazing way. And I, I, I'm very excited doing this kind of work too, because again, I want to see devotees empowered. And sometimes the nature of any institution, you just said that they we became creating brahmacharis. And sometimes the nature of the institution becomes to, to preserve the institution and just follow the hierarchy and to be a good chela. And every institution becomes like that. It's not just a fault of ISKCON. We have a very two good qualities going on in ISKCON. We have the Bhagavatam and the Holy Name. And as long as those two things are there, everything's going to be okay. We spoke about this before in one of the previous sessions. But we need to have some room for intellectual, artistic devotees to expand and, and to do research, to do something really exciting, to contribute something major for our sampradaya in a, in a secular kind of way that scholars appreciate, just like someone writes a thesis for their master's degree or, or PhD, we, we want to give some facility for devotees and people interested in this culture to come and write a thesis, do hardcore research on topics like Radharani and Jagannath, or, or the history of, of Westerners not being allowed in the temple, or so many things, and be able to get a degree for that. And we want to facilitate that, and, and so many things will happen with that. That's remarkable. Actually, in some ways, uh, what you're doing is path breaking because in India, religious studies has been quite highly neglected. I had a podcast with Krishna Khetra Maharaj, and it seems that in India, secularism grew up to mean not neutrality toward religion, but neglect of religion. So, and one reason for that, I have been still exploring this, and I'm doing some I'm reading of Indian history. The main understanding I got that was India was, India was born through a bloody partition, a ghastly, or a million people are supposed to have lost their lives. And the partition was largely caused by religion. So many of the Indian leaders felt that at, for India to preserve its uh, new secularism, its territorial integrity, let's, let's sideline religion from the public square. Let's sideline religion from the education, from the, it, it can, you can never sideline it, but that was their attempt. So religious studies are not being done in India at all in academic level. And, uh, yes. but then what is happening is we may not study, uh, we may not study, but somebody else will study. There is an international journal of uh, Hindu studies. I had, I had read some issues. They have like a panel of 12 editors and not a single Indian in those editors. So then our traditions, representations in the mainstream world come from people who really don't know our tradition. 
so that is unfortunate so like you said told about the scholar that uh, that uh, that he appreciate so we have to take that, appreciate your perspective. i i'd like to to support what you're saying I, i'd like to illustrate that in, a, in a, not just a figurative way but in a literal way one thing i i, I have an interest in art i i grew yeah. up my my uh, stepfather was an artist and uh I, I grew up around artists and art colony. And one of our books uh, is right here, Matur Meets Bindavan. We had illustrated lavishly with traditional Patachitra art. But I found out some things about Patachitra art and also this uh, Rajasthani art that a lot of the culture is lost. Now, if you go to uh, Konart Place in downtown Delhi, you've probably been there a few times. Hmm. Uh, you'll find many people selling Rajasthani art. But you look yeah. at the paintings, it doesn't move your heart. Because as you're saying, the, the, the Indian government is preserving, quote, the culture, but they're not, they're neglecting the heart of the culture. And so we have an interest also with Gora to promote the arts. And I'd like to show you three things that are happening with this. This is one of them. This is the painting done by uh, one devotee who works for this, Champakalata Biharani. This is the same painting was behind me in the wall. This is three logs of wood, Jagannath Baladi Subhadra. It's a phrase my grandma uses that Jagannath Baladi Subhadra are three logs of wood drowning in the ocean of Radha Bhav. <laughs> and this is illustrating that. And let me show you just two other paintings also. Uh, my point being that, that we're trying now to get, we're getting Western devotees and we're, we're speaking to them about the philosophy and the culture. And then they're seeing that culture through their own particular eyes and they're, they're making paintings of it. And I want to expose the, 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 the thought, not just the thinking or the commentaries of the Western scholars, Western devotee scholars, but also this paintings. This is done by Anapaini Radha, who's a oh. Russian devotee who works with the sun. And you see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Jagannath, and we were speaking about this in Radha and Krishna. And I'll show you one last painting. This is done, this particular one is done by uh, Madhaji named Raja Kishori, and uh, she's uh, living in St. Petersburg, Russia. And this is a painting, this is just a, a small portion of it she's doing for me right now. This is a painting illustrating Gambira Leela, uh, as described in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Leela, Ancha Leela chapter 14. There's a verse describing how Mahaprabhu is embracing Srubdhamada Goswami and crying. So they're, they're coming up with this art. So I, I would like to see Gora to be a kind of fusion like that of thinking, of good thinking, good feeling from the West. And when you bring this to India, when, when local artists and people see this, they're struck, oh my God, there's so much feeling in this painting. We should have this also. So this is something that we're hoping to try to contribute with Gora amazing. and accomplish. That's amazing. You know, just to kind of, uh, reinforce this point, I had a podcast with a devotee from Europe, Jayanand Prabhu. He did his PhD in... Uh, forms of atheism in, in Northern Europe. And it's very striking <laughs> forms of atheism. So he said, forms of atheism. <laughs> so he said there are atheists who believe in God. There are atheists who like religious observances. And there are atheists who value spiritual experiences. So I asked, what do you mean by that? <laughs> so he said that there are atheists who believe that there's some ultimate reality, but they just don't believe that the God of the mainstream religion that they have acquired, that is not the God that they accept. So they accept God, but not some God. So, so uh -huh. his point was that, so, but that these atheists, they may accept some ultimate reality. In some ways, Einstein was like that. But there are quotes of Einstein as a, when he says, I believe in the divine intelligence and I, the religious experience is the most profound, but he is strongly critical of the conception of God also at times. So he was more like a, a Theist who didn't accept the conception of, you, you can call him an atheist, he's not exactly an atheist. But the point is, yeah. one is that the people don't believe in God. They, they believe in God, but still they call themselves atheists because not they don't have a conception of God they can accept. And there are these atheists, he says, they value spiritual experiences. They may not believe in God, but they go to a cathedral. And this is majestic. 
or they sit they sit for some for some religious music or religious hymns or they behold some uh, sacred art and they feel there's something special over here so their experiences point them to something spiritual and in their case their reason their rationality their intelligence may be the last element which comes in and he was making the point can you hear me prabhu yes yes yeah so he was making very point. interesting point Thank so you. he was making this point that if we make reason rationality belief philosophy as the first entrance point for these people they will never come in so his his point was that we can open as many doors to krishna as possible and there are people who value spiritual experiences they say yes i experience something special when i go to some places like this so they may appreciate meditation because and they may even chant some sacred sounds without believing that they are talking to about some god but that helps them feel higher and there are atheists who value religious ceremonies and religious culture there is a book called religion for atheists so what they say is <laughs> <laughs> they say that religion <laughs> sub- <laughs> that religion fulfills some deep rooted social and emotional and psychological needs which atheism itself can't fulfill so the point uh, uh, so the so he was making that there are atheists who come together and they have the sunday gatherings where they will sing some songs and they will do some rituals so, so actually the point is that if we just take stick to philosophy now philosophy is important no my, no point no that not undermining it but there are people who may be open to who open to spirituality open to krishna bhakti but not in the way that a uh, organization can offer so there is so it's it's what you are doing in one sense is opening doors for all those people like i was i was very yes. appreciative to hear that i mean delighted to hear that not is appreciative that even scholars who may I, not I, be I, de- devotees that you will facilitate their research also so that's remarkable Mm, yes bro i i your, your comments remind me i'm reflecting back on something you said earlier about uh institutions and and i think a lot of atheists in the world today like, like i grew up in america i grew up in a very fundamental christian family and i became an atheist at one point because i i rebelled against the christian upbringing that i had it didn't make sense to me it was fanatical it was bizarre I, and I, I didn't like it, but my atheism was really just anti-Christianity, or at least anti-churchianity, we might say, a, a particular flavor of Christianity, not that I'm against Jesus or something. So many, a lot of atheists, they, it's not that they're against God, as you said, but they don't like institutions. And as you've commented several times in this discussion tonight, that uh, if we we need to have multiple ways to reach people if the only way we have to reach people is through an institution through a formal church it, it's just not going to work with a lot of people and there's yeah. so much to offer in krishna consciousness and, and and another topic frankly too is that some in some ways maybe that that formal institution may limit devotees too may limit the individuals that's another topic yes that's true so now this limit point oh well, if i may just tread this territory so some of these understandings like you talked about the advaita parivar their understanding some of the understandings may be slightly different from what our understanding of gaudiya vaishnavism is so even mm-hmm. I, it's it's very unlikely that all the books that are written in a tradition I mean, all the many books you mentioned they will all be speaking exactly the same theology so there will be divergences Well, of course one is you mentioned that we will preserve even books of opposing ideologies opposing philosophies but uh, when we encounter in our research understandings that challenge our current understandings of gaudiya vaishnavism or of krishna consciousness so how, how do you deal with that or how do you plan to deal with that well first according to our philosophy Vrindavan does talk or in Chaitanya Bhagavad he says that Jay Rupa Chinche Dasi Say Rupa Hoy that the Lord manifests according to the mood of a devotee. 
Now, we, what, what you're mentioning is, is a concern a lot of devotees have. Oh, my God, what if you start reading these books and you go crazy? <laughs> you get some strange idea and then you, you, you leave Krishna consciousness. You start some strange thing. But I find those kind of problems or those differences even within our, our main books. What are the two main books dealing with the life and teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? The two main books. Chaitanya Bhagavad Chait and Chaitanya Charitamrita. Exactly. So which one is correct? When wow. in, in Chaitanya Bhagavad, it says the Sarva Bhoma Bhattacharya it was a Vaishnav before he met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it says that he, he was a Mayavadi before he yeah. met Mahaprabhu. Which one is correct? So if we go deep, even in our own books that we have in front of us, we'll find things which may disturb our minds. But if we have this understanding of Vrindavan Das Thakur's teaching, Jai Rupa Chinti Dasi Se Rupa Hoy, that the devotee sees the Lord according to their particular mood, then we can accommodate that. And not only can I accommodate the Panchasakas, these are five different Odia Vaishnavas and Arisa, which generally Gaudiya Vaishnava is considered to be an upper sampradaya or a few upper oh. sampradayas. Okay. Sorry, sir, but what was the mood we you can, before you went? What was the, the mood of? Which mood do we accommodate? Do we accept? We can accommodate different moods. And what to speak of Panchasakas, who I, 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 I've been to the Bodo Odia Mutt, which is a, a mutt started, it's the most prominent Panchasaka mutt, which is started by Jagannath Das. And you go into the mutt, and, and I see a, a painting of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda. It's the first thing that I see. And there's some verse written underneath it. I don't read audio very well. So I asked the devotee with me, what does it say? And it says, it says, Chanada peace, Nityana, Tarori. It's six astakam. And you go in the temple, they have Radha Krishna, they worship Gornitai, they read Srimad Bhagavatam, they worship Tulsi. They, they offer prasadam, they do practically all the things that we do, but they have some things that, that we're not really into. For example, they, they, they put a lot of stress on mudras and astrology and some things which we might consider to be a bit mechanical. But for me, and I'm not representing ISKCON in this regard, I'm representing myself, which is something I'd like Gora to do, to represent individuals and not represent an institution but individual thinking, which is important among scholars. Different mm -hmm. scholars have different thinking. When I uh, see these persons, it doesn't disturb me. Rather, I'm, I'm happy. Wow, they chant Hare Krishna. They, 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 they appreciate Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Nityananda. They read Shik Shastakam. That's great. If I meet a Christian, I look for common ground. If I meet someone practicing Islam, I look for common ground. We were going to some Islamic countries for, for giving classes. I can't even mention the names. <laughs> but we were going there some years ago, and we had some experience. They took us up in the mountains. And we, my wife and I were wandering around the mountains, and people would see us and invite us into their home and give us some tea or something to drink. And it's just so sweet and loving. And they're, they're Muslims. But we found some common ground in different ways. And that's the kind of thing I want to look for, for common ground, and then respect someone's right to have a different opinion, but go deep and be firmly fixed in our own tradition at the same time. So definitely we will find other things that are a little different, sometimes at odds even with our understanding, but sometimes we'll find very sweet things. I can share with you two sweet things that I found, if you're interested, that I found in audio yes. literature. So just Shall we one, get into that? One, before you go into that, just this point about yeah. this broadness in accepting. Uh, this has been to some extent, it's very much in the mood of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, isn't it? Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about uh, ex if I go to the holy place of some other religion and I, I respectfully be there and appreciate how God is manifesting in a form that I don't appreciate. And that appreciation increases my devotion to the Lord I know in the the Lord in the form I know. Yes. <laughs> so that in one sense, instead of feeling insecure on seeing somebody having some other understanding, if we actually it can increase our own our own devotion also. Yes. I like your word insecurity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's a big part of it. 
Sometimes we're so insecure, we have to make up, we have to try to convince ourselves by, by preaching and bashing other people. And that's a that's shame right. because I, I, here, in, here in Pori, somehow we've met many different people. There was one, there was a uh, interfaith dialogue some years ago in Mayapur, and some different people came. And we had, at one point, we had a Christian missionary and his Christian preacher and his wife here in Pori, and they're friends with the devotees. And we were taking the different tirtas and things. We, we had another time we had some, uh, we had a Jewish couple, we've had a, a Muslim couple, and none of them were interested in changing their faith. And none of them did I try to change their faith. But I just was their friend. And I just said, hey, there's this really cool place I want to take you to, because they were interested in experiencing something of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So I love that. Let's experience it, like you're saying, the scholars. And so we take them to Tota Gopinath Temple, and I tell them the story of Tota Gopinath, and they just feel the presence of Gopinath, and wow, this is amazing. And then I say, you know, let's do some kirtan. Yeah, I love kirtan. And we do kirtan together. And we love each other. And then they go back to Israel, or they go back to, to wherever, they're, to America, or their Christian church, or whatever. And I made a friend. And probably they're never going to become an ISKCON devotee, but they're going to appreciate something about ISKCON, and maybe they gain something. I, I'd like to tell you a little story. I yes, was making books and magazines for my Gurmars, and sometimes in the course of doing that, I did something which is not very accepted in any religious institution, but I would go to other groups, like the Gaudiya Mutt, to meet different senior persons and give them a magazine, give them a book, and just be friends with them, and sometimes ask them some particular research question or something, because I'm doing something scholarly, right? And I remember I'd done that with one popular Gaudiya Mutt person, and I'd heard from their Acharya a little bit. And a few years later, I happened to be at their place, and someone invited me for Prasadam, and I'm going down the steps, and coming up the steps is one of their leading sannyasis. And I saw him, and I said, oh, Maharaj, you know, my friend, I haven't seen you. And when he saw me, a, a look of annoyance came on his face, a look of kind of disgust. And immediately I felt a little hurt. And he said, I'm sorry, Madhavananda. He said, but I find it very difficult to be friends with someone who left my guru. And then I had to tell him, I said, Maharaj, I don't think I ever came to your guru. I just came to your Sangha for a little while to share something, some book or something. And yes, I heard a class or two from your Gurmash. And I'll never forget that exchange. And, and that person's changed since then. But that exchange said a lot to me. I don't want to be like that. If someone comes and they spend two days with us or two months or two years, and then they decide to leave and they decide they don't want to be a Vaishnav, but maybe they like Prasadam. Or maybe they like the Hare Krishna mantra. So they, they become a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, but they keep one thing they've gotten. I want to celebrate the fact that they're our friend and they, they took one thing from us and, and kept it there. But the problem is in institutions, it, it's all or nothing. <laughs> we so want true. everything from you <laughs> or nothing. It's a shame. So true. I mean, I, it's, it's, see, it's sometimes when you see that thing in somebody else affecting us, that's when we realize how objectionable it is. Otherwise, we might do it and we may not even realize it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you know, it's like... I it remember, hurt my feelings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, one, of the, one of the devotees with whom I spent a lot of time and uh, I learned a lot from him. And he, he, he was very kind. He was very compassionate. And, I, and uh, he answered a lot of my questions. And I was very grateful to him. But then I was connected with already with some devotees with the group and they had my Shiksha Guru. And then eventually when I took initiation, he, he came to me and he told me, you betrayed me. I said, oh. what do you mean? He said, I thought you came to my Guru and you left me. I said, no, <laughs> I came to you, not to your Guru. <laughs> And I respect you as a guide, but somehow he presumed, I thought I was just, I have an intellectual seeker and he was an intellectual guide. I was simply getting answers from him and I appreciated the answers, but somehow so, so it's almost that uh, some, in one sense, the seeker may have a more broad-minded attitude than the teacher sometimes. <laughs> so that's unfortunate. 
Yeah. Sorry, could you hear me? Yeah, and this yeah. Yes, I can. And this this same mentality we yeah. see in ISKCON sometimes too. So true, yeah. Uh, you know, some preaches to you and then they just expect you're going to take initiation from their guru. And yeah. we do this a lot in ISKCON and it hurts people. Part of the problem I think it is we think then that people belong to us. I own you. Yeah. And that's wrong. Krishna owns them. I don't own anybody. We, we should never think like that. You, you don't own your wife. You don't own your husband. A guru doesn't own his disciples. They have a relationship which is based on love and trust. And there should be some faithfulness in that relationship. But it's not that you, I own that person. That there's a kind of violence there when we have that kind of possession. True. In one sense, Possessive attitude. Yeah. In one sense, we condemn fruitive activities. But actually, in our preaching, we are very fruitive. <laughs> okay, what fruit is going to come? Is this person going to become a devotee, chant the holy names? Now, we understand there has to be some level of reciprocation. But the reciprocation doesn't have to necessarily be in predefined terms. Like say you spend time with this Israeli couple, that was because they were interested. So if you're talking with them and they had no interest, then you would not spend time. But that reciprocation can need not be restricted to particular forms. Reciprocation doesn't mean that you have to start chanting Hare Krishna tomorrow and then move forward. No. Can I add one thing in this direction, Prabhu? If you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. See, I when I have been last few years spending a lot of time in the West, and many devotees feel that somehow we are too Indian in our culture, and that that obstructs people from coming to us. Mm -hmm. So then I have right. talked with his Krishna talk West. His, yeah. Okay. Krishna West is. I mean, Krishna West is one expression of that. There are others also who feel, have yeah, that concern. Right. But yeah. so then I talk with Indranandan Maharaj, and he actually uses the culture to attract people. Then I, I had an elaborate talk with him. Then I talked with some of his disciples. I, I had not been to I not been to actually the festival in Poland or other places, but I read about it, and they use the culture to attract people. So I was wondering, why is it that? So he says that actually the culture attracts people. People are eager. We present the culture and they come. So I realize that the, it is not that people are against the culture. See, there is a there is cultural curiosity and there is cultural commitment. So we don't keep a sufficient gap between them. People mm. are curious about the culture. And when we present the culture, actually... I read a book of a Western author who came to a pilgrimage to India. And he said, my first experience was like a, a, a sensory overdrive. The food is so colorful. The dresses are so colorful. The place. <laughs> so all my senses, they get so much stimulation. <laughs> so actually, they, from the cultural perspective, people have curiosity. But unfortunately... From the curiosity, we very quickly expect and demand commitment. And that's what alienates people. So actually, the culture itself is not the problem. Our expecting people to adopt the culture and adopt it too fast, that is the problem. Otherwise, people have interest in culture. So that oh, if we don't impose, but if we just present, I think the culture can also be a way we draw people to Krishna. And that's what you did in your own way with people from very different denominations and different backgrounds. Yeah, I, I can tell you for myself, when I, I, I grew up as a preacher, as a brahmachari in the Los Angeles temple, going out and doing book distribution in the airport and on Harinam and so many things. I had a very traditional background in preaching in ISKCON. But when I had these people come, I didn't even think about preaching to them at all. I don't even care because now I've got them. <laughs> I've got them for four days or five days, whatever it is. And, and, we're, and they know, they, they want to experience Kirtan. They want to experience Jagannath Puri and the deities and the temples and the stories and the culture and things. And so I just presented it as an experience. And I'm in complete ecstasy <laughs> that, that I'm giving in this experience. And I have the strong feeling that even if they walk away, which they very well might, and never chant again, or never come to Pori again, or never do it. At least this one time in their life, they had Darshan Atota Gopinath, Patit Pavan Jagannath. They took Prasadam, they heard some philosophy, they did Kirtan, and they had a good experience. 
at least one time. And I feel so happy with that. Why can't we have a little more broad-minded attitude like that, that this is our friend? This person lived in our temple. He was initiated by my Guru Maharaj and did service for so many years, did so many things for Guru Maharaj. And then later he had problems and he went away. But he's part of our family. The, the, the poet uh, David Kinandandas, he sings, Hoi Cheno Hoi Bena Prabhu Jata Das, Sabara Charana Vandon Dante Korigas, that all the Vaishnavas, Hoi Cheno, all the Vaishnavas in the past, uh, and Fakir Rambu explained this to us once. He said, another meaning is all the persons who used to be devotees, but they're no longer devotees. Really? Hoi uh, Bena means all the devotees in the future. Another meaning is all the persons who are not devotees yet, but they'll become devotees. I offer my pranams to them because they're so special. He lived in the ashram for two days. Oh, my God. That's such a special thing. Once, I'll tell you a quick story. Once we were doing some collection and book distribution in Las Vegas, Nevada. Las Vegas is another word for hell. <laughs> and uh, we'd collected huge amounts of coins, like hundreds of U.S. dollars, hundreds of dollars worth of coins. And what, how do you change those coins in? And we had like big, huge bags of coins. And so we thought, we'll go to the casino, the gambling casino, because they have machines where the coins come out. And you can cash them in at the cashier. So <laughs> we put on hats and Western clothes so we don't give it away. And we're standing in the queue with these big bags. And we've got bald heads and some uh, baseball caps on. And, all, and it's this place that it's very low lights and everything's red. And there's people gambling everywhere. Everybody's drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes. There's prostitutes walking around. They have legal prostitutes there. It's hell. And all of a sudden, one of the security guards walks over to us. And he says, excuse me, are you Hare Krishna devotees? Yeah. Oh, my God, you know, now, now we're in trouble. And I said, uh, yeah. And he said, really, you know, I lived in the Toronto temple for two weeks. <laughs> it's so nice to see you guys. <laughs> and I, I was so happy. This is our friend. Maybe he's working in hell. And maybe he's not following any principles anymore or anything. But he's our friend. Because he lived for two weeks in the Toronto Temple. <laughs> My God. So this requires such a, such a, I mean, it requires such a broad attitude. And otherwise, it's as you said earlier, it's one or zero. It's one or zero. And if, say, I was expected to be at 80%, and even if I come down to 60%, I start feeling I have become a failure, and there is no place for me over here. So I, just, from, I could be at 60%, but because I feel that being a devotee means 80%, so I don't, I become so discouraged that I don't even stay at 60%, I go down to zero. So why not accept somebody yeah. at that 60%? That's, and actually that is the mood of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita also, you know, 12th chapter, he talks about, if you can't do this, then do this. If you can't do this, then do this. So, yeah, the, the, so, what, so you know, what is striking me is that, the whole Gora project is not just at one level a project of scholarship or just of devotion. It's also, you could say, a project of compassion. That in one sense, you are giving access to the tradition to people who would not come through the normal channels. And they get connected mm -hmm. with devotees and they appreciate devotees. That is their, that is their, that is their way. That, is their, that may be the only way they grow in their spiritual life. They may not grow by any other way. That's one perspective, but I'll tell you something else, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, honestly. I'm greedy. I get so many wonderful things. I meet so many wonderful persons. Huh? Let, let me share with you a couple of things. Yes, please. You're, you're asking about the, the culture in Orissa. Yeah. Here in Orissa, to this day, practically every village has some kirtan groups, and they do chari prahara, ashta prahara, sola prahara. It means 12-hour kirtan, 24-hour kirtan, 48-hour kirtan of the Hare Krishna mantra. And even amongst the smart Brahmins, the smartest here in Orissa, there's a tradition with the Hare Krishna mantra. When the bride gets uh, married, part of the ceremony is they initiate her into the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. That's part of the smart tradition here. Oh, and there's a song, there's this nice song that we found about the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, which Fakir Mahaprabhu shared with us. I think it's very similar also in Hindi, so you'll understand the, the meaning. It's very simple language. 
It's about the Maha Mantra. Rama Nama Ladua, Krishna Nama Gi, Hari Nama Kanda Kira, Gori Gori Pi. <laughs> that the name of Lord Ram is like the Ladu, Krishna's name is like Gi, and the name of Hari is like Kandakira, sweet dry. So you take the Rama Nama Ladua, you add the Krishna Nama Gi, then you add the Hari Nama Kandakira, and Gori Gori, you mix it together, and then P, you drink it. <laughs> oh, this is a traditional song. So I'm benefiting. I love this. So what you are saying is, so in one sense, you are talking earlier from the Las Vegas perspective that people may have no connection with Krishna and still we can friend, be friend with them. But here people already have a connection with Krishna and Gaura. Yes. So we learn so much from them. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, why not? It, it's such a wonderful thing. I, and I sing this. I sing this in the villages and people go crazy. Here's the verse right here under the screen. Ramanam Aladua, Krishna Namagi. Harinama Kandakira Gori Gori P. We printed this in our Krishna Katami to Bindu magazine some years ago also. Amazing. So let me share another one with you, another real favorite that I have. This this I this Ramanama Ladua Krishna Gi verse is something that, that Fakir Mormabu shared with us. And uh, I'd like to share another verse with you that he also uh, introduced us to. This is um, from this this poet whose name let's see, I've got the book right here. His name is Bhakta Charandas, and he wrote this book, Manasiksha. This is a commentary on Raghunath Das Goswami's Manasiksha. So you may remember, if you're familiar with Manasiksha, yeah, it yeah. begins with Guru Goste Gostali Su Sujane Bhusudagane. That's the first line. The very first word in Manasiksha is Guru. So Raghunath Das Goswami is telling my dear mind, you should respect Guru. So what does Guru mean? Who is Guru? And Gostali si Sujane, Sujane means the, the Vaishnavas. Who are the Vaishnavas? What is their role with me? So Bhakta Charandas is given a kind of uh, song commentary on this in Oriya language, which no one knows. Where This is one of the things we're translating. I'll just put this on the screen and I'll go ahead and sing this. Diksha Guru Pe Swayam Shri Govinda, Siksha Guru Rupe Radha, Vaishnava Swarupe Sakigana Sarve, Hori Beto Bigna Bada. Diksha Guru Rupe Swayam Shri Govinda. We should see that my Diksha Guru, huh? Uh, uh, Krishna says in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, Acharya Mam Vijana Yam Nava Manyetakari Chit, that Guru Dev. He's Saksha Duritvin. He's non different from Krishna. That's Diksha Guru because he's a person who gives us mantra. And Siksha Guru Rupi Radha, our Siksha Guru, who's giving us uh, our uh, Abhideya, he's giving us the process that's a general function of the Siksha Guru. He's like Radharani, he's giving us devotion. So then, what are the Vaishnavas? Vaishnava Sarupe Saki Ganasarve. The Vaishnavas are the gopis. And Hori Beito Bigna Bada, these three all together, they remove the Bigna or, or the obstacles in my path. <laughs> Amazing. It's beautiful, isn't it? There's, there's some great treasures in the line of Shamananda, Gadadhar Pandit, Rishikananda Prabhu. These are Sudagodiya Vaishnavas. We're not talking about anything controversial, right? There is some controversial thing. There are some Vaishnavas who, like uh, Jagannath Das, who have a little different idea. Uh, uh, Chutananda, they, they stress more astrology than we do and such things. There are some differences, but there's a lot of similarities too. There's a lot of literature, which is, it's our literature. It's our Gaudiya literature. Shamananda Prabhu is a Gaudiya Vaishnav. Rasikananda, Gadadhar Pandit is one of the, the Panchatattva. Uh, there, there's so many literatures of their followers. And so these are going back literatures. Verse, sorry. How did you explain Radha is the Shiksha Guru? Shiksha guru? You said, what Diksha Guru is understood. You said Saksha Dharidvena or something like that. But how is Radha the Shiksha Yes. Well, Diksha Guru is our Sambandha Data. He's Someone a person who gives us our connection with Krishna. He is our okay. connection with Krishna. And he is our connection because he gives us mantra. Okay. He gives us Krishna. Then the Siksha Guru, the Diksha Guru may also be the Siksha Guru, but the Siksha Guru tells us what to do with what we've gotten from the Diksha Guru. So the Diksha Guru is Sambandha Data, and the Siksha Guru is Abhideya 
Datta. He's oh, okay. teaching us Abhideya, the process, and that's Radharani. Radharani is teaching us devotion. The Diksha Guru gives us Krishna in the form of mantra, but Radharani gives us the process. She, she teaches us that, that uh, how to behave with Krishna. That's such a sweet understanding. Otherwise, we think Radharani is like too far away for us. But she, it is by her mercy that we are able to practice bhakti and relish bhakti. Here in Arissa, I, I could go on and on about it. It's something we want to publish. Spoken Mumba did a lot of research about this. The worship and literature of Radharani is older in Arissa than anywhere else in India, including Braj. Now, I'm talking about secular history. I'm not talking about Radha and Krishna's pastimes or whatever like that. Yeah. But in, according to manuscripts in writing, you'll find more of a tradition of Radha. And for example, here in Arissa, Radhastami is still a government holiday. For many people, really? whereas in West Bengal, Durga Puja is the big holiday. But for many people in Arissa, it's Radhastami. The first deities of Radha, who were worshipped by the Gaudi Vaishnavas, were with Govindaji and Gopinath. And those deities came from Maharaj uh, Purushottam Jana, the son of Maharaj, Pr 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 uh, Maharaj Prata Parudra. This is described in Bhakti Ratnakara of Narahari Chakravarti. Yeah. Those deities were sent by him to Braj because he heard Govindaji's there without Radha. But there was a tradition in Arissa of worshipping deities of Radha before those deities went to, to Braj. There's a deep tradition of Radha in, in Arissa, very, very Rasik, very nice thing. And it's such a thing which can really enhance our own devotion and also be very attractive for outside people, as you're saying, like with Indira Dumna Maharaj and others who are doing, presenting the, the traditional culture like that. I very much love that. When I give class or something, I like to sing songs, to tell traditional stories. It's attractive to people. But I'm also doing it through the particular lens of this Bideshi, this Western devotee who's come and lived here for some years. And my perspective is not the same as the local people. I, I'm a kind of a cross-cultural person. I, I can't really live in America anymore. I'm no longer an American. But I can't live here either exactly because I have white skin and I'm always going to be a Bideshi. <laughs> so even if I learn to speak audio perfectly so they can't they, they can't even tell in a dark room that it's a foreigner speaking. I'll always be a foreigner as soon as they turn the light on and they see the color of my skin. I'll never really fit in properly. <laughs> and that's, that's a kind of curse or maybe a blessing. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I mean, you may feel that they may not accept you as a, as a Odia, but actually they will accept you more because you're not Odia in a sense. Because in I'm India so still has that uh, a few years ago um, I was asked to give a class on Gita and cricket. So it is a complicated class. How do I connect the two? But anyway, the point at that time, it's, I read a little bit about cricket at least 10 years ago. We say India is a cricket mad country. But actually, it is not so much a cricket mad country as an international cricket mad country. That means in a uh, an uh, Indian in an Indian local match might score a triple century, but it may no, make no difference. But an Indian in a match against Australia or England or something like that does well, he becomes famous. So the, this was an example that was given to show how Indians feel validated when anything about India is, is accepted <laughs> or appreciated on the international stage. So yes. in one sense, your, your complexion will actually increase the curiosity and the appreciation of Indian culture among Indians, among of Odia culture, among Odia That's remarkable. Over the last 25 years, I've many, hundreds of times maybe, I've taken devotees to the temple of Tota Gopinath. I was there today doing kirtan. And when we sit down and speak or do kirtan, a lot of times the local people gather around us and they're just marveling. Here's this Bideshi and oh my God, he's quoting Sanskrit <laughs> and Bengali and this and this. And they're, they're completely bewildered. They're very, very attractive. Sometimes they cry. I had an experience some years ago when we bring the Western devotees, or devotees, not just Western, the devotees to Arisa, to Puri. I like to engage them in something practical. And so if we have enough time, we're not always doing Parikrama, Harinam, and Kata, whatever. But I like to engage them in doing some Dham Seva. And so one of the things that we do, sometimes we take garbage bags 
and gloves and we go someplace and we pick up garbage. And once we did that behind the Gambira, and there's a, now they have a walled in area there, but before there was before the wall, there was a big field kind of behind it. And it's just full of nasty garbage. And he had about 50 Western devotees out there picking up this garbage and putting it in bags. And then after about an, half an hour, an hour, there was a crowd uh, and about eight or 10 Babaji's standing and looking at it and they were crying. It just ripped their heart out that the, the Western devotees are so humble that they're coming and doing something which, which average Indian person would consider the service of a bungi, right, or some low class person. And here's persons, these initiated devotees who are chanting, they're so humble, they're doing this, and they were crying. So it's a beautiful, in that sense, I guess, Gora means a, a cultural meeting that, that I would like to have. This is my, if uh, Gora is, is a canvas, I want to use different types of paint, traditional paint, but also some Western paint. And I want to make a composition, which is a cultural mix, kind of fusion, like we have fusion music. Sometimes they do some Indian mantra chanting, but they also add an electric guitar and they have a uh, also in a sitar or something, but they have a, a fusion kind of thing. So intellectually, culturally, in terms of art, and also in terms of, we haven't spoke about it today, but a big passion we have is agriculture and natural living, eco living. Uh, that also, they can learn a lot. And we, we can learn from them how they grow plants and things in their culture. And we can also teach them things. Leela Purushottam, who you met earlier on Anapani Rada, they both studied permaculture, which is a Western kind of system, but it's very, very applicable for Indians also. And that's something I'd like to share with them and show how we can make a better world. Something which is just, uh, it's practical. It's not just philosophy and, and something in the air, but art means life. And, and our life, how we, what we eat, what we grow, our, the, how we build our houses, that everything we do should be art. And that's, that's something we want to share with Gora. That's amazing. You know, I was thinking about the word Gora as you're telling it. Uh, you may not have intended it, but in vernacular in Hindi, Gora also means fair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Gora refers to non-Indians, yes, it... especially <laughs> British or American people. So... That's the fourth meaning. This is you who are starting it. It's a start, something started by a person with a fair skin, but it is, uh, it is maybe because of that, it will have more impact than what it would have otherwise. Hmm. And, uh, and to me, that's, that's real. I, 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 you know, I, I grew up in America, as I mentioned, in a Christian family and things. And, and when I joined the, the movement, I was very much curious and, and attracted, fascinated by the culture and the dress and the music and so many things. But at the same time, also, I felt lost and I felt confused and I felt like I, I didn't feel very comfortable with it because I didn't know how to put on a dhoti. I didn't know how to properly put on tilak. I didn't know the mantras. I couldn't pronounce Sanskrit properly. And pretty much all Westerners go through that. But at a certain point, those Western devotees they, they learn those things to a greater or lesser extent, how to put on a dhoti, how to put on a sari. That, mm. that doesn't mean you're a devotee. <laughs> but you learn some of these cultural things, how to make a chance, how to make puris, or how to make pizza and offer it. <laughs> we learn these. And, and then we're going to have to apply it through the own lens of our own perception. And that's, that's an important part of bhakti. Not just that I try to become a clone of the Odia people, but I'm my own person. I, I, I'm, I'm the son of my mother and my father, and they taught me certain things, good things. And I want to keep those things. And I have my own particular cultural roots, which I always want to remember. And I think this is one lesson we get in Pori from the Namacharya Haridas Thakur, who never, never said, I, he identified himself as being a Muslim. He didn't go to the temple and say, hey, you know, I was Lord Brahma. I am Lord Brahma. I installed the deities here. Get out of my way. But he always accepted, I'm born in a Yavana Malecha family. And he wore that culture. So in that sense, yeah, Gora also means a Bideshi. Gora also means a fair-skinned person. And it's, it's a good, good title for us in that sense also. And I, I don't want to try to imitate 
and try to be something that I'm not. I've seen sometimes Western devotees come to India and maybe they marry an Indian girl and they become more Indian than the Indians. <laughs> they become hardcore fanatics. They, they learn to speak Hindi or they learn some Sanskrit and they become more fanatics about the culture sometimes than the Indians do. And I don't find that very natural. I, 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 I should be who I am. I, my mother fed me pizza and cake and pasta when I grew up. And I've been eating dalma and rice and chapatis for many years. I like them. I, I can eat that the rest of my life. But if someone offers me what my mother cooked in a prasadam way, I like it. That's my culture. And I can't deny that. And, and I, I, I find that the local people here respect it. They, they expect that. They didn't come close to me. If I'm just trying to be a clone of them, it, it, the novelty wears off pretty fast. But they're more interested to see who I am as a Westerner who's coming to Krishna consciousness and imbibing their culture. And how do you see us? How do you see our culture? That's something we can offer. But sometimes we can't offer it because we can't see it ourselves. We don't understand ourselves well enough. We're not comfortable in our own skin. And we're trying to be something that we're not. We're trying to imitate an ideal which is not actually us. And this is also, for me, an important part of Gora. Where it's a meeting of cultures, the Bengali culture, the Odia culture, and also you're pointing out the white skin Gora culture. <laughs> yeah, true. You know, what you just said about the past, quite often, as when we become devotees, we are taught that the past is just, a, our past is just a burden to be shed. And while there is, there is something in our past which is a burden to be shed, but there is also a lot from our past, which is a resource to be built on, which is a resource that can help us grow. And... Uh, you know, sometimes we just neglect that completely, and uh, that that has uh, we are we are as you said we are not being ourselves. We are just splitting ourselves. We are denying, and then what happens is everything that we are, we claim that this is transcendental, this is spiritual, but that's not spiritual. That's that's an expression of our past, <laughs> and it can be like that. It can be used spiritually, but it doesn't have to be something which uh, we have to reject from our past. If I may share one experience recently, one that's okay, it's for a few minutes. I know I don't want to go over time. We'll finish in a few minutes. Yeah. So you now this whole idea of uh, can you hear me, Prabhu? Yes. Sorry. Uh, okay. I'm just making a note. Yeah, sure. So the about the past, there was one devotee Mataji from uh, from abroad, from the West. She called me and she said that uh, recently her mother passed away and she was quite old. And the, she's the eldest sister, so she had to go for the funeral. And they had in the memorial, they, they had to give a talk at the memorial. But she says that my whole family is against bhakti, against God. And in general, in those kind of funeral settings, it's they considered very intrusive to talk about God. So she says, I don't want to talk. If I don't want to talk, I can't talk about Krishna. So then I told her that, you know, this is not, don't see this as an opportunity simply to glorify Krishna. See this opportunity to glorify your mother who was brought into your life by Krishna. And, <laughs> <laughs> so he says, what, what good you learned from your mother that help you as a devotee. <laughs> now you don't have to tell her, tell them that I am appreciating this because it helped me as a devotee. But just talk about what you learned from your mother and what, what she meant for you, what she taught you by her actions, by her words. And she and don't talk about Krishna over there. You, know, you just think there is you are doing this to your mother who gave you this life and who gave you whatever you values by which you became, which helped you as, as a devotee. So she said that and she told me that after she talked, you know, all her relatives were so happy. She said that. So she, and then my sister, her younger sister came to her and she said that, in, that uh, you know, I lost my mother today, but I got my sister back. So she said, I had lost you to a cult. I thought you never cared for us. You cared. You were only into this God business. But I, today I saw your human side. I said, I got my sister back and she came and hugged her. And so you know, we all have got so much from our past. And yes, some of it is undoubtedly bad, but to reduce our past entirely to the bad thing, it is, it is not only artificial, it is we are depriving ourselves of resource that we could build on. 
I, I think it's even offensive because we have teachers. We have people who loved us, who helped us. I, I, you and I have one thing in common, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. We're both charis. You're a brahmachari, and I'm a mamachari. What do you you're, 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 <laughs> you're situated in Brahman, and I'm a follower of my mother. And my mother is someone I was very close with, and I learned many things. I learned to learn, love literature. She was a librarian. I learned to think. I learned to appreciate the outdoors and gardening and, and plants and animals and things. Those are gifts that I got from my mother. And I want to always remember that, those gifts that she gave me and, and the, the, the qualities of honesty and things that I learned from her. How can, I, how can I divorce myself from that? And yes, there were bad things that I did before I was a devotee. And those things I'd rather not talk about because it's not going to be helpful. But there are things that I got which are very good things. And why, I, that's part of me. And even the bad things are also part of me also <laughs> mm. that I have to come to grips with. And, and those bad things can help me to, to, to know how to speak to certain kinds of people. I can speak to certain kinds of Western people and that. I, who, I, I understand their mentality and things like that. That's, that's natural. Just like Lord Nityananda, when the thief came and uh, he, Mahap, Nityananda Prabhu converted him into a devotee, the first thing that he told them after he became a devotee, now you go and preach to the thieves. So that's natural. And, and, and Vaishnavism, actually, we speak about Vanashram. We haven't spoke about it in this talk, but when people talk about Vanashram. Vanashram means it's going to be different. The Vanashram in, 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 in Mumbai is different. The culture is different than Arissa. It's different than, than UP. It's different than, than Rajasthan. It's different than South India. And then what to speak of China and Japan and Norway or America and Mexico and Vaishnavism is going to manifest in a little different way in those different places. It's, you know, the devotees in Russia, they, they like to eat uh, grechka, uh, buckwheat, and, and they like bread and they like soup. And if they don't have soup and, and, and bread, they, they want to cry. The devotees in Italy, they, they like pizza and pasta. They, they're going to cry. They're going to die. And that's part of their culture. It doesn't have to be a different thing, but let's use that for Krishna. And we should also learn this traditional culture, what Rupa Goswami gives, and what Krishna Das Kavras Goswami says that Mother Yashoda cooks for Krishna. And when we cook for the deity, we should try to cook those things that Mother Yashoda and Radharani cook for Krishna. We should learn that culture. But it doesn't mean that I have to become a robot and forget the culture that I come from or try to deny that. As you said very nicely in the story, you're, you're not a real person then. And, and we're just trying to fool ourselves. Sociologists speak about this in conversion of religion. It's a common thing. If someone, maybe, maybe they grew up as a Christian, and then let's say they decided to convert to Islam. All of a sudden, it's a completely different culture. They don't know how to read the Quran. They don't know the rituals. They don't know the, the ceremonies and things. But, and now they've lost all their friends. When they converted all their Christian friends, now they hate them, their family maybe. And so to make up for that, they become fanatics so that, that the people in their new religion like them more. And I've seen so many Western devotees who grew up in some other religion, some other culture, take to Krishna consciousness, and they become fanatics in the same way because they want to be loved. They want to be accepted. I personally think this is one reason why Srila Prabhupada wanted all the devotees to come and spend one month a year in India, or better yet, he said to come and spend some time here, like six months or a year or two, and try to learn an Indian language. Because when you learn to speak some Indian language, I can read a little Bengali, I know a little Indian language, you learn culture. I can give a lecture about Vanashram Dharma and I can tell the ladies, you should be chaste and, and chaste to your husbands and do this and this. And I can have a list of quotes from Srila Prabhupada there. But you're not going to give someone culture in a one hour lecture or even a two week long seminar. You're not going to give people culture. But if you come and live in India, and you see the way the ladies dress, you see how the traditional ladies behave with their husbands and how the husbands behave with them and how they're interacting. And, they, and you learn the subtle nuances and you learn, well, they dress like this in public, but sometimes if you go to their home, maybe they're, they're not dressed in the same kind of way. You learn the subtle things also, what's accepted in a subtle way. That culture will come to you in a deep way. 
it, it's, it's not just something we can get from a one-hour lecture. So, I'm just trying to connect. So, you're saying that at one level, even if somebody is not going to adopt a culture fully, but still living in a culture and observing it, we will be able to learn some refined things which we may adopt according to our own ways. So it's, we are not going toward either extreme that we don't reject this. This is simply Indian culture and has got nothing to do with me and not our birth culture. Now I'm a devotee. So it has got nothing to do with me. We try to learn what we can. So in one sense, it's like the Saragrahi, we see the essence. The Audud Brahmana talks about uh, the 24 gurus, the Avanti Brahmana. So it's almost like that with respect to culture also. Yeah. Uh, let me give you a nice example. You know what this is, right? It's a bead bag. Yeah. So how many devotees know, okay, we know this finger is supposed to be outside the bag. Yeah. We know we have 108 beads. And we know, uh, some devotees don't know, but we know Prabhupada wouldn't chant on your beads unless you had a string marking off the first eight beads. Why is that? Why do we, why is there 108 beads? Why do we keep them in the bag? Why do we keep this particular finger outside? Now, some people will say, well, Prabhupada said so. Prabhupada said it, I believe it, that settles it. Right? That's okay, but there's a cultural reasons behind it. First of all, this bag is not just a bag. There's a, there's a verse, Tribanga bangima rupam vena ranga karanchitam gopi mandala majastam smarami nanda nandanam. This is a uh, mantra some Vaishnavas chant before they, before they begin their japa. That they're meditating that this meru bead is Radha and Krishna, and it's 108 gopis headed by the astasakis, which is why Prabhupada wanted this string tied here. This is the astasakis, the big beads. And they're doing gopi mandala majastam. They're doing gopi mandala means that the raslila is going on inside a kunj. This bead bag is a kunj. That's why we keep the beads inside the bag. That's why the beads are moving. It's a Ras Lila. Now, why do we keep this finger outside? Why not my thumb or some other finger? Why this finger? In Ayurvedic medicine, this finger has a name. It's called Bish Angul. I think you understand in Hindi. It means the poisonous finger. Because this is the finger that I use when I complain about Chaitanya Charan, that rascal, <laughs> or this or that. When I criticize someone, this is a finger I point at somebody. So this finger has no business in that Ras Lila. And so we keep it outside. <laughs> so there's so many cultural things like that, which we can just blindly follow. But if we come and we live, these are things that I, I didn't know in America, but I learned after living here in Orissa for many years and speaking to local Vaishnavas and things. And I find it so much more satisfying you know, someone can say, Prabhu, you got to keep your beads in the bag and you should chant like that. Why? You have to keep his finger out of the bag. If you don't have the finger out, it's bad. Why? I don't know. Prabhupada said so. That's okay for neophytes. But if we want to go deeper in bhakti, when we have a philosophical, cultural reason, we understand why we do that. It's so much better. And those whys, that requires some time. That requires some, some reading and literature. It requires meeting people, meeting sadhus, mixing with people. Something which, which we don't always do when we're protected in our little Krishna conscious bubble in the West, in, in a temple or something. And I, I love meeting local devotees, local people in, in Orissa. And I always go to them with the attitude that I'm representing Srila Prabhupada. And I had to be very, very careful. I had to try to be a nice Vaishnava because when they look at me, I'm a reflection of Srila Prabhupada and my Guru Maharaj. So I'm very careful that if I go to meet some sadhu for some research, and I, as I did once at Radhakon, for example, and I asked one Mahant there about some of the old Shiv Lingas around Radhakon because I was writing an article about that. I don't go there like a lost soul, like a lost puppy looking for an owner. I go there with a stamp on my forehead, owned. I'm owned by my Gurudev. I'm owned by Srila Prabhupada. And I make that, they, they, they get that idea right away. I don't necessarily go and tell them right away, but I'm going there as, a, on a, as an emissary of my Guru Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada to do this research work. And, and they respect that. And I've never, and if somebody doesn't respect that and they want to try to uh, break my faith 
or, or preach against Srila Prabhupada or ISKCON or something, then I just, uh, that's why God created wristwatches. I just look at my wrist, I don't have a wristwatch, but I look at my cell phone or whatever, and I say, I'm really sorry, but I forgot I have a meeting, I got to go. And I just get up and walk out. And they know it doesn't happen to me very often. I can only think of once or twice that's happened. They know I, I committed, they committed some offense. They shouldn't have spoke like that. It's beautiful. So in one sense, what you are doing is just by exploring, because they are connecting with Prabhupada and seeing you as a follower of Prabhupada, once they see that you are, you are committed, they are not really going to pull you or demean Prabhupada. But then you can move forward and work with them and we can, there's so, much, so many things we can do together. It's amazing. But I, at the same I, time, I, and I don't want to try to act like a mature person, I'm not. I'm not mature enough to associate with everybody. I'm not mature enough to hear certain things. It hurts me. I stay away from certain people and certain things, but uh, it, it, not everybody can do that. And, and we have, you know, in, in spiritual life, we also have a lot of babies. And we should respect that babies need an incubator. Small children need a fence to stay inside of in the yard. And that's important. And I've seen that in every institution also. They tell their followers, don't go to ISKCON. <laughs> don't go to the Gaudiya Math. Don't go here or there. Stay with your guru. Everybody says like that. Just like the parents tell that to the child. We spoke about that in one of our previous sessions, I think, too. Yeah, that is true. So, you know, Prabhu, this is uh, been such an illuminating discussion. It's, we started from, it's one project, but the inspiration behind the project brought up so many different dimensions of how we practice bhakti and how we can go, how we are meant to practice bhakti, how our tradition has taught it. And it's amazing. Can I just go back one question and we'll conclude? Maybe if I, 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 if you, yeah, sorry. Uh, you mentioned that. I very, very much. I'll, I'll just say this real quick. I very much hope that with this project, I can have association with devotees like yourself who are, who are Guru Nishta, who are firmly fixed to your Guru Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada, because that's, that's necessary. It's, a, it's an absolute requirement for anyone's advancement in bhakti to associate with, with people in their own who are Swajatiya, Swajatiya Shriya Snigla Sadhu Sangha Satovare, Rupa Goswami says in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And my grandma has translated Swajatiya, he said, as being in the same group, coming from the same guru. I very much want to work with, with friends like that who are very faithful to Srila Prabhupada and our Guru Janas, but I also want to work with the devotees who are broad minded and who can genuinely not just appreciate, but even love people from who have a little different perspective, but have some similarities with this. We may be friends with them because they also chant Hare Krishna, or they also appreciate Jagannath or, or some, some cultural similarity. That's so true. Actually, I would say you're giving me far more credit than what is due. I'm realizing that there is so much, by associating with you, I'm realizing that there's so much treasure in the Gaudiya tradition that, uh, I have no idea of and in one sense our tradition has given us so much to nourish our heart and uh, we the more we discover it the more we get nourished and the more we can share that nourishment with others it's amazing so, uh, but it requires a good strong foundation you can build and make a big building and a fancy yeah. top of it, but there's no strong foundation, it'll fall down. And our strong foundation for all Vaishnavas, doesn't mean just ISKCON, but for all Vaishnavas, their foundation is Guru Nisha. And for devotees in ISKCON, it means that they should be, have some fixed connection with Srila Prabhupada. They, they, we should be, have gratitude for Srila Prabhupada, what he's given. That's our foundation. And if we have a strong foundation, then we can go and we can find out other amazing things because, and, and it can decorate the foundation. We'll bring it back to be part of the building and use it for Prabhupada's service. That's our, our desire. It's beautiful. You know, I was talking with Anuttama Prabhu and he told me that every, he organizes a journal of Vaishnava studies, not journal of uh, Hindu or uh, Christian Vaishnava studies. So he told me I do it for three, four days every year or five days a year. And he says, I get a special kind of rasa, special kind of nourishment by it. I won't want to do it every week or every day, certainly every day of the year. But that gives me a... So he I asked him, what is the 
uh, what is it that these are not people are going to get converted so what what is the purpose of doing this so he told many purposes he said for my he said we, we as a movement need it because we are a minority religion and they are the majority religion we have to have a good connection those are practical reasons but he told me personally i appreciate how god is acting in other traditions so you know we often think more in terms of that was a revolution statement for me we often focus more on what a person is doing or not doing in relationship with god you know you're chanting this mantra wrong you're having this belief wrong but irrespective of what people are doing god is acting in everyone's life and if we can appreciate that it opens a whole new dimension for krishna consciousness so you know every scholar who is even the scholar could be studying anything but if they study decide to study say gaudiya vaishnava literature there is somewhere krishna is acting in their life or chaitanya is acting in their hearts so we can appreciate that and help them take a few, uh, take a step forward so yes uh, that was a respond point about how you said that you know, we have to have a foundation and then there can so many different fruits that can come and those fruits are not just for others but for ourselves also yes yes bro so from yeah, when we yeah go one, one thing i always try to do when a guest comes to my house we had a guest that came just before our talk i mentioned to you one of the, the pujaris from toto gopi not temple came to our house and i gave him some sweet words i gave him a couple of gifts i gave him one of our magazines and one of the things i told him i said when you come in here i feel as though gopi nath has arrived in our house and he really liked that it. it really touched his heart whenever i meet someone an outside person especially if it's in the if it's in an iskon temple and they're an outside person or even if i'm representing my guru maharaj and shila prabhupad it through gora or whatever i feel like uh i should be learning something from them because everybody has some valuable thing when we do some interfaith dialogue i've also had the opportunity to do a little bit of that and if you go there with the attitude that i want to convert them <laughs> that i want to teach them i want to show them we're the best all you're going to do is get in arguments and you're going to feel very frustrated because they're not going to agree with you because they're probably already fixed in their religion themselves but if you go there with with a humble attitude let me see what i can learn and i and i found some of these christians or even muslims or or, or people practicing judaism they have amazing a uh, uh, nisha to, to the lord they have amazing realization sometimes i feel like they have more devotion than i do and i learn from that i i see their renunciation or maybe their dedication whatever it's some particular quality they have or some understanding we we hear about saint francis of assisi who i know radnath maharaj is very fond of speaking of i also like to talk about him he's one of our heroes there's so much i can learn from his life Now I'm not suggesting that that all the devotees should go out and start reading comparative religion <laughs> books to try to find some but when we meet people if we always have a humble attitude and and this person has something I don't have I can learn something from them then we'll find so many doors open and people are so happy with us and this is the mood that I'm trying to to apply agora with here in in, in Jagannath Puri I'm not coming in like I I I'm I'm a big know I don't know anything but I'm coming to them like a beggar that I love your culture and I'd like to serve you and you ha- I I want to get something from you for your culture and it charms them all of them love it <laughs> and and they're for all the rickshaw walls and everybody in the area they know us <laughs> amazing yes bro so for maybe one last question i said last question several times now but if devotees want to know more about this project or want to assist or contribute is it your facebook page or you have a website or how do people come to know more what they can connect and contribute okay. or how can they do that we have a facebook page and it's uh, facebook.com g o r a research one word g o r a research we're on facebook and we also have you can find out there on our gora page we also have a uh, go fund me thing which you'll become very popular with us <laughs> if you want to give some donation for helping our project we're trying to raise money right now both for almiras and ac to preserve books to buy books and also long term we 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 want to purchase some property and try to get to school and get some things going like that so 
that's an answer to your question. Everybody likes projects. This is our project. <laughs> Hare Krishna. That's wonderful, Guru. This is so inspiring. Thank you, Guru, for sharing all this. Can I try to summarize? Or would you like to add some things? Yeah, please. Because we can continue discussing a long time, but I want to respect your time also. We had a wonderful discussion. So, today, we discussed about, I would say, the project which you started Gora, multiple meanings, Govinda Radha, Govinda Radha, and then a variant of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as Gora, and also as, uh, <clears throat> what was the third thing you mentioned? Gaur- Gaudiya, Gaudiya Research Gaudiya, Association. Gaudiya, of course, the acronym for that, yes. So multiple, and then of course, toward the end we discussed about it, can refer to you, you as a person who is... Uh, I'm a Gora. <laughs> Gora. <laughs> so you mentioned several of our literature, which are which were preserved. You talk about your two inspirations, your Guru Maharaj and Fakir Mohan Prabhu. And I, I really didn't know much about, especially Fakir Mohan Prabhu. It's amazing how much work he has done. And the whole universe of, I could say, Odia Vaishnavism opened up for me today. I had some understanding of it, but it is remarkable. And within that, I mentioned about your desire not only to... Uh, it was three things you said preserve publish and then practice so practice. with respect to devotees they can come and do some research if they want even the scholars who may not be devotees they can also be facilitated in doing research and in this way actually something which could not be done in the institutional boundaries they can be done in a very effective way i think from that point onwards we did discuss a lot about the broad mindedness that's required or uh, that can help spread Krishna consciousness and Gaudiya Vaishnavism far and wide. So many points in that connection. One is that when people come to us, we don't have to convert them. We just give them a good experience, help them explore. Then that itself, maybe somebody from Israel, somebody from some other part of the world comes. That may be the only experience of Krishna consciousness they have. And if that is a happy experience, that is going to be their eternal asset. And if we can have that service attitude, then we can reach a lot of people, otherwise whom we just shut off within the institution. And then you talked, we talked about how there is this whole, uh, we have certain stereotyped uh, definitions of success and those, they may, be, they may be helpful for organization, but if we want to influence broad society, people who are not going to necessarily come to the organization, then we have to open more doors for them. And these could be various doors. You mentioned this point that society and culture, sometimes we think if I have a society, we have an organization, and that will establish the culture. But it's more that when there is culture, from that a natural grouping of people happens, and that's how a society emerges. So the people can share cultural values. So it could be appreciation for art, it could be appreciation for literature, and it could be appreciation for music or dance and and then through that, people can bond. And that's that's one way of sajatiya. One sajati is, of course, we are serving Krishna in the same way. But sajati in the sense of interests, which are ultimately centered around Krishna, that is also another way. And then in that connection, you talked about your experiences living in, living in Orissa, how you're sharing this and preserving this, it, it attracts and sometimes astounds people. People, as you said, when you are speaking, quoting Odia and Bengali, when you hear visits to Tatagopala Temple and others, people appreciate that. And uh, overall, the you quoted several beautiful verses about the research about how the restrict, official restriction on entry of foreigners into Jagannath Temple came up during the British times, or where is Radha in the with Jagannath? So Jagannath is actually he is Krishna externally, but Radharani internally. Hmm. As Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in one sense is Radharani externally and Krishna internally. So that's a, it's a very special insight. And uh, all these uh, devotional insights, you also talked about some beautiful verses that Krishna is like the Diksha Guru and Radha is the Shiksha Guru. And the Vaishnavas are our, are our they are the Vaishnavas are like the Sakis. So in that way, their three are removing our devotional obstacles. So there are, there are nuggets within the tradition which are like, you could say, pure nectar. They can inspire us so much if we relish them. 
and there may also be some things which may be slightly different some understanding which is slightly different from what our understanding is but even they can be appreciated because they are also a part of the tradition they are also pres- they are also part of the culture and we can we don't have to be so insecure that we have to prove everything else wrong so that we can be practice so that we we feel strong here you repeatedly emphasize that if we have that foundation in prabhupad's books and we read prabhupad's books but there are people who are interested in books itself and they have this wide variety of books and we preserve them and then they access those and that is the way they are coming closer to krishna so it's uh, not only that they coming closer to krishna but especially the culture is what they have lived in then we can learn from their culture and uh, our past so that toward then you made this point that the two things you know, we want to learn about the traditional culture of gaudiya vaishnavism and we want to preserve that practice that at the same time we all have a particular culture that we came from and to simply reject that is artificial and it's even offensive so we adopt what is there from that which is favorable there is much that we have to we have to give up but there is much we can adopt also and that way what we have is more of a more of a hybrid or a or a blend which is natural to who we are and in that way so gora the last being as you mentioned is of a white complexion actually inspiring a you could say a local a local revival of interest in gaudiya culture just as when prabhupad came there's a indian cultural pride in prabhupad bringing western disciples so similarly your researching this culture the odia gaudiya Go- Go- odia culture that is going to that is inspiring people to take explore it more seriously also so of course there are many other points but this was a brief summary you want to add anything in conclusion prabhu just you always astonish me chaitanya charan prabhu with with your memory and your heart for the devotees and, and i really really appreciate the contribution you're you're giving a society encouraging people to think and i just love your association and i have a strong request for you that you please come to poya again sometime and give us a chance to have your association here in our ashram we'll show you the other books we can sit and have a long talk in person and we'll give you prasadam because you're too skinny <laughs> <laughs> i'd love to be there and i will become skinny so that i can come there and you can fatten me <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your association through it was, i think we had thank many so sessions much. but this was one of the most devotionally direct and devotionally enriching also thank you so much i look forward to your association again in the future sometime soon thank you very much thank you, you, you do. do hari krishna glorious shilo prabhupad thank you krishna